Buenas and half a day, todos Hamzu. This hearing on the Committee on Public Accountability, Human Resources, the Guam Buildup, Hagatna Revitalization, Regional Affairs, Public Libraries, Telecommunications and Technology is called to order. It is now 8.35. My name is Mary Camacho Torres and I'm sitting in for the chair, uh, Tina Rose Munya Barnes, uh, as her vice chair on the committee. For the record, in accordance with 5 GCA Chapter 8, subsection B107, public hearing notices were sent on Friday, November the 4th, adhering to the five days notice, and a second public hearing on Wednesday, November the 9th, 48 hours prior. In addition, this hearing was noticed on the legislature's website. Written testimonies may be submitted by emailing to Senator Munya Barnes at guamlegislature.org or you may hand deliver to our offices at 163 Chalan Santo Papa, Hagatnya, Guam. On the agenda this morning, we have four bills, bill number 30836-COR, bill number 33136-LS, bill number 347-36-LS, bill number 354-36-LS. Joining me here this morning is Senator Tello Taidegui. Thank you for joining me. Before we proceed I, with the discussion, I'd like to first provide some general rules of conduct for all who are in attendance today. The conduct of this hearing shall be as follows. The chair will invite individuals who have signed up to testify. Individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and shall state their name for the record purposes. The order of questioning will begin with the panel of senators and each member will be allowed to pose a question to an individual testifying for a round and will be provided another round if necessary. Questions and testimony may be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda only. Personal inference as to the character or the motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violations of this general rule of conduct will result in removal from the public hearing room. With that being said, we will now move on to the first item on the agenda. Welcome Senator Brown and Senator Ada. Bill number 308-36 COR is the first bill on the agenda. It was introduced by Tello T. Taidegui, Joe S. St. Augustine, Joanne Brown, and V. Anthony Ada. This is an act to amend section 12303C of Article 3, Chapter 12, Title 12, Guam Code Annotated, relative to strengthening Guam's emergency reporting system by restricting local exchange carriers, voice over internet protocol providers, and commercial radio service providers from deducting more than 5% from monthly E911 surcharge collections for the administrative costs. I will, I will invite Senator Taidegui, the main sponsor of Bill 303-36, for her opening statement. Sijusmasi, Madam uh, Chair, and half a day. Half a day to everyone here today. And thank you for scheduling this public hearing on Bill 308 and for this opportunity to summarize the measure. Madam Chair, Bill 308 seeks to establish a reasonable cap of 5% as the portion of the 911 surcharge collection that service providers may retain to help cover costs associated with collecting and transmitting these funds to the government of Guam. Bill 308 was introduced in response to issues that were raised during the fiscal year 2023 budget hearing from the Guam Fire Department, which was held in May of 2022, in which Senator Brown, Senator Ada, and Senator Joe St. Augustine was also pre present and had some concerns regarding this measure and uh, supported, of course, this bill for the change. And during the budget hearing, GFD representatives sought the assistance of senators concerning the portion of the monthly enhanced 911, E911 surcharge collections that is retained by service providers. According to GFD representatives, an average of 85 cents of the $1 monthly surcharge is remitted to the government of Guam with the remaining 15 cents retained by service providers for administrative costs. Following GFT budget hearing, I wrote to the Public Utilities Commission, PUC, 
requesting for a copy of the Commission's established policy or guidelines governing the portion of 911 surcharge collections that may be retained for administrative cost. Madam Chair, 12 GCA Section 12303C authorizes each local exchange carrier, voice over internet provider, or commercial mobile radio service provider to deduct from such remittance its actual expenses incurred for collection services, maintaining the public safety answering point database and for reports and audits as may be required by the commission. In a letter to PUC, I referred OPA report 210-06 relative to the enhanced 911 emergency reporting system fund, <clears throat> excuse me, which recommended for PUC to establish, quote, a standard formula to equitably determine allowable administrative expenses, unquote. Madam Chair, the concerns raised at GFD's FY23 budget hearing are consistent with the findings contained in OPA's report number 21006 issued October of 2010. The OPA found that the local service provider administrative costs were above rates established by the service providers in other U.S. jurisdictions. OPA report 210-06 asserted that administrative costs in Guam are inconsistent and are higher than the rates issued at other U.S. jurisdictions. The OPA found that service provider costs range from as low as 1% in Texas, 5% in North Dakota, and New York and Pennsylvania, 2%. Based on its review, the OPA determined that local service providers administratively retained as low as 3% to a, to a high of 31% for each surcharge dollar. In comparison, the Enhanced E911 Emergency Reporting System Fund received as much as 97 cents as to as little as 69 cents for each dollar surcharge collection. Madam Chair, for reference, Hawaii currently authorizes that each communication service provider or reseller may retain 2% of the sur surcharge collected to offset administrative expenses associated with billing and collections of the surcharge. The sellers and providers in South Dakota are allowed to keep an administrative fee equivalent to 2% of surcharge. In response to my request for a copy of any records the PUC may have which reflect the certain the certain of standard formula as recommended by the OPA and which summarizes its review of the annual 911 surcharge collection and the revenues which are withheld by service providers for administrative expenses, the PUC wrote, wrote back stating that administrative expenses for collection agent constituents at most is slightly over 7%. The PUC reported that from fiscal year 2011 through 2017, the total annual amount per year retained by collection agents to cover the administrative costs was roughly 144,000. Out of an annual remittance averaging over $2 million, the total amount administrative costs for all telecommunication companies in Guam was in the range of 144,000 a year. Madam Chair, based on GovGuam financials, 2,135,465 was collected for FY21 and 2,203,976,000 was collected during FY2020. These amounts represent net 911 surcharge and they do not represent the total amount service providers collect prior to deducting costs for the administrative expenses. The 5% cap for administrative cost in Bill 308 is a starting point, and the ceiling may be amended if justified, if justified by PUC service providers, providers and GFD. 
E911 surcharges collected and deposited to the government will ensure that these surcharges paid by consumers of Guam's emergency reporting system are accounted for. Madam Chair, I look forward to the discussions, including any amendments that may be needed going forward, ensuring that we implement a standard administrative cap, which removes any doubt customers, service providers, and the government may have on whether 911 surcharge collections are being used to support our local emergency reporting system. Bill 308 prioritizes public safety and the requirements our first responders will recognize a critical role telecom providers serve in collecting these funds in a timely and efficient manner. Sijus Masi, Madam, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to present Bill 308-36. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. I'd like to now open the floor for those individuals who have signed up to testify orally. And may I call up to the panel Mr. Robert Kelly, Mr. Fred Harecki, Mr. Daniel Stone, and Mr. Daniel Tidinko. And gentlemen, uh, I will call on you by the order of which you signed up. I also want to acknowledge that Jim Smith of it &E and Kevin Riley of GFD also submitted testimony, but their testimony was uh, indicated as written testimony only. So we are going to begin with Mr. Kelly. Uh, as with all of you, please state your name for the record, and, uh, and then you may begin with your testimony. Mr. Kelly. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. My name is Robert Kelly, um, resident of PD, and I work with uh, MCS Group, including MCS Sales and Services. As an active telecommunication consultant and businessman in this community for decades, including continuously maintaining the National Emergency Numbering Association or NINA certification as an emergency numbering professional since 2002, I commend the authors of the subject bill for bringing this topic forward for consideration. I, in support, I suggest two improvements to the text and close by pointing out an apparent oversight in the administration of current law and legislative scrutiny. Bill number 308-36CR proposes a percentage cap on administrative costs unless a higher share is approved by the PUC. I would suggest that a 6% be a fair, safe harbor percentage instead. Much has been said in section one of lower fees in other jurisdictions. However, in these markets, telecommunication providers serve much larger customers across multiple mature state and national regulatory regimes found in market size and not found in the market size and regulatory reality of Guam. And just to kind of point out, in Guam, our carriers have measured their subscribers in the tens of thousands, and nobody's even close to 100,000 yet. In the U.S. mainland, Verizon has 142.8 million subscribers. T-Mobile has 110 million subscribers and AT&T 101 million. Even the smaller resellers all have over a million subscribers each. So when we're comparing the fixed cost to mainland subscribers and averaging it out per subscriber, it's not really a fair comparison. Our regulatory regime is clearly evolving evidenced by the subject bill. Local company and administrative costs to cover mandates are relatively higher. And again, it's because of the number of subscribers to pass uh, the average through. Direct costs that exceed the safe harbor threshold of 6% for administrative and operations to provide mandatory service can be specifically presented to the PUC for approval. On the latter point above, individual carriers on Guam may not have anticipated specific investments in technical features required by the E911 or now the NG911 uh, system chosen by the government of Guam. Such private firms will face additional expense to become fully compliant within the public system and should be able to recover additional amounts for program specific fees it collects. And I might add the Federal Communication Commission requires that any 
uh, fees that are reimbursed carriers be only for those things that are exclusively used for the E911 or NG911 system and are fair and reasonable costs. So if it's putting up a cell tower and saying there's 911 on it, that would not count. It's got to be exclusively those items that are purchased by the carriers to support 911. Uh, the concern about the additional cost is not only shared by private firms, the government faces also additional external costs to fully implement E91, such as refining our GIS system for mapping and geolocation instead of depending upon the telecommunication providers to implement a publicly uniform and accurate system. I might add that Guam, in separate from the 911, we don't have an accurate GIS system that goes to, for each of the villages, has common streets and geo and shape locations. Normally, when a, a uh, entity 911 puts that in, they take the existing county or area GIS system. Guam is behind on that at this point. In closing, I point out that Taito Government Solutions, a private firm engaged by the government to assist in implementing a current gen next generation 911, is providing telecommunication services as defined in Guam law. Does Taito Solutions have a certificate of authority? Are its fees subject to PUC uh, review and approval, as are the other telecommunication providers in this jurisdiction? Should the Commission subject Taito Government Solutions to its authority? I recommend a relevant decision policymakers address this apparent oversight to objectively ensure cost for service incurred by the government and the carriers, which is fully paid for by the subscribers, is fully justified and reasonable. Thank you for considering my perspectives on Bill 30836 COR. I am available to assist your committee and staff on this and other telecommunication matters if you think that would be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. May I now call on Mr. Horecki? Please introduce yourself before you provide your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair, Senators. My name is Fred Horecki. I'm the Chief Administrative Law Judge of the Guam Public Utilities Commission. This morning I will present the testimony of Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, the Chairman of the Commission. For the reasons stated in the testimony filed and this oral testimony, the PUC opposes Bill 308. First of all, Bill 308 does not amend the existing law at all, and when you look at the current law, the bill is contrary to and in violation of the current law. Under existing law, the PUC is responsible for determining what the actual expenses of the providers are and what amounts should be deducted from surcharge collections. This bill provides a flat 5% limitation, which is contrary to the actual expenses that providers are entitled to under the law. Now, the current law has been in effect since 1999. This bill does not amend it. It provides basically that the providers shall be authorized to deduct from remittances, that's of the E911 collections, its actual expenses incurred for collection services, not a percentage, actual expenses. And then the provision goes on to provide that the deductions must be consistent with a PUC approved budget for such expenses. Of course, by implementing a flat uh, percentage, that's contrary to this provision. So the arbitrary 5% limitation violates existing law and deprives providers of the right to deduct their actual expenses. Secondly, this bill would restrict the ability of the PUC itself to cover its expenses in conducting regular, regulatory activities required by the law. So for the PUC regulatory activities involving 911, it is funded through the surcharge collections. You know, the, the deductions don't just go to the providers. That's a funding source for, for the PUC. 
A flat 5% limitation will endanger the ability of the PUC to collect its surcharge expenses. If the providers exceed that amount, then PUC will be unable to obtain such amounts because it is the provider still that must pay those amounts from the collections to the PUC. The PUC has been handling this matter of surcharge and actual expenses for over 20 years now. In many dockets, PUC has assessed regulatory fees and costs against telecom providers. There has been a protocol set up by the PUC which establishes the exact procedure. In GTA docket 1802, there the PUC recovered nearly $4 million that the government of Guam had transferred from the E911 fund to the general fund. There were a lot of regulatory proceedings. The bill amounted to about $20,000, and that was paid out of the E911 collections. By enacting this bill, the legislature would endanger the funding source of the PUC. Thirdly, uh, the bill interferes with the independent rate-making authority of the PUC under both the Organic Act and local law. What the legislature is doing here is to directly engage in rate making by determining what costs are allowable in the 911 surcharge. In 12 GCA, the Guam legislature has already delegated the rate making authority for the 911 surcharge to the PUC. And part of that is determining what the actual expenses are, because you don't know what the surcharge should be until you determine the actual expenses. But here, the, the legislature would be taking away the function of the PUC to determine actual expenses and engaging in rate making. That violates the independent rate making authority of the PUC established in the Organic Act and the policy in Public Law 2618, which established the strong public interest in a strong independent PUC. The legislature should decline to even consider this bill and should leave the power and authority to review and determine actual expenses with the PUC. Fourth, there is no need or justification for this bill. The PUC has already implemented a system for determining the actual expenses of providers which may be deducted from the surcharge collections. The bill seems to presume that there's a problem right now with the administrative expenses. But neither this bill nor the Guam Fire Department claim that the amount of the 911 surcharge funds are insufficient. Collections are over $2.2 million a year. The bill really doesn't establish a reason to reduce administrative costs. For the period of 2000 to 2003, the PUC did an awful lot of work on this matter. We had dockets, it was before I was there, but dockets covering the, the protocol for reimbursement of administrative expenses. The PUC looked at the expenses of each collection agent, each company, and established what, what the budget and what would be allowable for that. And I provided a copy of the protocol, which was enacted in April 20, uh, 2003, and various other dockets that have affected this matter. So there was a very lengthy process to determine what the actual expenses should be. And the protocol recognizes that companies are reimbursed for their actual expenses. That's the way it should be done, not by arbitrary flat percentage deductions. The, this bill would destroy the carefully crafted system in the law for regulating the 911 surcharge. And number five, the percentage limitation is not reasonable. There, there is insufficient and inadequate data to justify the 5% limitation. Uh, apparently, the Guam Fire Department claimed that 15% is deducted as costs. That has never been presented to the PUC. 
if the fire department thinks that administrative expenses are too high or anyone else thinks that, there's a process. Come to the PUC. Ask the PUC to look at it because under the law, the PUC is control of what the administrative expenses should be. But the GFD has never come to the PUC. No one has come and said to us, oh, by the way, can you look at the expenses? We think they're too high. Hasn't been done. And the law actually requires that the fire department petition the PUC. Look at the provision. They have to petition the PUC if they think there's a problem with the surcharge. Now, the bill relies upon the OPA report from 2010. First of all, I'd point out that's nearly 13 years old. And if you look at the data in the report, it comes from fiscal years 2004, 2005, 2006, really outdated. I would submit that it's not appropriate as a uh, legislative practice to rely upon such an outdated uh, study to set a, a limitation here. And there are a lot of issues about the uh, report, which I'll get into, but the total expenses, as was pointed out, administrative expenses, as far as the PUC can determine, is about 144,000 a year. Now, if you look at collections of over 2.2 million, not such a large amount. Even with the administrative expenses, there's still over 2 million left for the E911 fund. Uh, the bill would limit the deductions to 5% based upon the fact that uh, in 2010, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, and New York City were deducting that amount but we don't know how their, their percentages were determined. Do they fund the PUCs in those jurisdictions like we do here? Um, some states get grants to cover their E911. Others are funded by government funds. It's not comparing apples and apples, and I think without a really detailed research into those other states, you don't know whether they're comparable or not. As Mr. Kelly pointed out, uh, Guam is not the same as those jurisdictions. It's a very small customer base. It's a uh, uh, small amount of providers compared to jurisdictions in the state. So I think it's not proper to compare Guam to those jurisdictions without a lot more research. So in accordance with the Organic Act, and the local law governing the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC must determine the actual expenses of telecom providers, which may be deducted from the surcharge. It is not an appropriate role for the legislature. Bill 30836 should be rejected. If the fire department has concerns with the provider deductions, it should address those concerns in a petition to the PUC as is required by law. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Hareki. May I now call on Chief Stone to provide testimony? Afternoon, good morning, Madam Chair and, Sen and Senators. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for the Guam Fire Department to be able to present our testimony. Um, my name is Daniel Stone. I am the Fire Chief for the Guam Fire Department. Um, so I, what I'd like to do is be able to present to you my written testimony, uh, which, would, which starts with uh, the 911 emergency surcharge provides funding for the continued operation of 911 emergency dispatch services on Guam. This fee, which is collected and remitted by local communication providers, supports emergency, fire, EMS, and police services. Currently, administrative cost percentages retained by these providers are inconsistent and higher than the rates that are assessed in other jurisdictions, uh, and referencing the OPA report number 2010-06, uh, uh, as Mr. Harecki already uh, identified. With the Guam Fire Department's next generation 911 platform slated to on, be online early next year, this is an opportune time to revisit disparities and con conflict, conflicts in the collections related to administrative expenses claimed by the different providers. Therefore, it is the intent of the GFD to express support and agreement to amend subsection 12303 Charlie of Article 3, Chapter 12, Title 12 GCA in order to enact universal standards and ensure equity amongst all local telephone and commercial radio service providers. Thank you. Thank you, Chief.
the next on our panel that has signed up to testify is uh, Dan Tidinko from GTA. Please proceed. Off a day and good morning, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Senators. My name is Daniel Tidinko, Executive Vice President for Teleguam Holdings, DBA GTA. First of all, let me um, congratulate you and your colleagues on your reelections. To those of you who have served and are exiting public service, thank you for your service. And to those who have been newly elected, compliments to you as well. It's very heartening to see the 37th legislature will have a good mix of both new and also seasoned reason hands, hearts and minds in place to productively address the issues facing our island. Back to the closing business of the 36th here with this bill. After evaluating the measure, it was kind of interesting to read the legislative finding which asserts that 15% of every dollar collected by telecom providers for E911 has been retained by the service providers for authorized administrative costs. I'm not quite sure where GFD representatives got that figure. Moreover, given reference to a 2010 12-year-old public auditor report on the E911 fund, fund and the Guam Public Utilities Commission administration of the fund, I'm also not sure that the findings and context cited in this measure are timely, given that it is over 12 years old, given that the PUC has enhanced its oversight and responsibilities of the mandate, and given that the author of that 2010 report has been sitting on the Guam PUC as a co commissioner for the past several years and has a direct, had a direct role in oversight of the E-91 collections law. Senator, former Senator Doris Brooks, former public auditor, the author of this OPA report. She sits there on, on, um, with the Guam PUC with uh, Mr. Hrecki and a number of the other commissioners. When I read that claim in the legislative findings concerning the 15% administrative retention, I asked internally at our company what all is involved in this E911 surcharge collection and the costs associated with it. Without disclosing confidential and proprietary information that reflects market sh data share, I can unequivocally state that that assertion is incorrect. I'll note this historically since the establishment of the E911 law and associated um, um, uh, dockets, our administrative costs for collecting, processing, tracking, remitting, and reporting this has averaged about 8.6% annually. So for, eight, for every dollar collected for E911, what are the associated administrative costs for us? First, we're obligated to maintain the public safety answering point, the PSAP, which is in the law. That PSAP is the access point and call center where emergency and non-emergency calls are handled. Second, we have various personnel in the E911 chain here. IT, which handles all of the billing, which is reflected of the E911 surcharge. Accounting personnel, which is accounts receivable where an employee spends time on the bookkeeping. Accounting personnel, which is accounts payable, where an employee spends time on processing payment and getting payment approval. Accounting personnel, where an employee spends time at rev tax, remitting the payment to the treasurer of Guam. Accounting personnel, where the employee spends time preparing the monthly and annual reports and sending it to the PUC. Third, we have hard costs for printing on bills and po postage, which costs about $7,600 monthly. Fourth, we have collections fees for those who we remit E91 collections for monthly, yet have to contend with absorbing loss or collections costs for those who don't pay their bills. But nonetheless, we still remit these payments over to the PUC um, as, uh, as required. These are the hard costs justifying our administrative expenses. It's certainly not a profit center as some may think. Just look at the 2010 OPA report again concerning a telecom operator collecting E911 from its subscribers and contending with the administrative costs. In that particular report, the OPA, Public Auditor Brooks then, former senator, colleague of yours, and now PUC commissioner, she noted, one service provider told us that the PUC did not provide sufficient guidance regarding their responsibility as collection agents of the 911 surcharge. The provider has assessed its subscribers the surcharge since October 2008, but has not yet remitted the collections to the Department of Administration. According to the company president, their customer base is small and the cost of billing and collecting the surcharge exceeds what they collect. Thus, they retain the surcharges to recover their administrative costs. 
According to the company president, as of June 2010, they collected $8,413 in surcharges, but spent $9,450 doing so. We informed the company president that a petition for administrator services should be submitted for PUC's approval before E911 surcharges can be retained. We notified the PUC of this matter and they've contact contacted the provider. In September 2010, back then, the PUC and service provider were reviewing the surcharge collections and administrative uh, collections expenses. To Mr. Hareki's point, has GFD ever petitioned the Guam PUC under Section 2D of the original law to, quote, determine or to examine the adequacy of the surcharge at any time? Has GFD ever articulated to the Guam PUC that there's an issue with the bucket established under Public Law 2555, which is used to fund the just and reasonable expenses of operating and maintaining the 911 system? If not, then I'd suggest GFD articulate such and follow the laws ex it, it exists, rather than the body reacting to claims that the telecom providers are parsing 15 cents per subscriber account to cover the cost of, min of administering the collection of the E911 surcharge. If there's a need to modify the E911 fee to address costs, then that conversation has to happen. It should also include examination of the expense side over at GFD, particularly since the E911 was subjected to malappropriation in the previous administration. A corrective action was taken by Governor Leon Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Tenorio in tandem with the uh, Guam PUC. To and in tandem with the FCC to ensure that the previously misappropriated E911 funds were returned back to G GFD. Further, while we're on this, we urge GFD to transmit a bona fide request to all telecom providers on island to transform us from the current analog next generation 911 system, which the chief just noted may be coming up. I was just talking to uh, Mr. Carrera here from IT&E. At some point in time, when we do get the bona fide request and all of our companies do the procurement for the necessary software and the equipment to integrate with the new 911 system that GFD is going to be putting online, it's permissible under the law for us to recover those costs. Um, I, I forgot what the, just, uh, the true and justifiable costs were. I think uh, Mr. Kelly had noted those. But that's not insignificant, whether it's it &E or GTA or Docomo, it's going to cost us you know, somewhere in the ballpark of at least half a million dollars each to recover those costs for all of that software and hardware necessary for standing up the next system. We do not believe the fix here on the cost side is the cure-all solution. If there's a need for a separations accounting study to help zero in on what is just and reasonable for telecom providers to retain for administrative costs, then permit the Guam PEC to order such. That separations accounting study would examine accounting methods, procedures, and controls established to gather, record, classify, analyze, summarize, interpret, and, pre and present accurate and timely financial data for reporting in compliance with the applicable laws, regulations, and management decisions, and may include subs uh, subsystems, subsystems for specific areas such as indirect and other direct costs, such as compensation billing, labor, and general information technology. And it would, of course, be an additional cost to rate payers, ultimately, because somebody's got to pay for that particular docket and that cost study. I really don't think the current retention rate is out of line, given that our consultants and the PEC and, the, and our accountants have parsed out that it is justifiable and mirrored in other jurisdictions, given our size. I can say this with regards to our administrative costs. Our, our accountants did the calculation and considered what I had noted earlier including billing protocol, programming, billing platform upgrades, and administrative costs incurred monthly for billing and collecting the surcharge, maintaining and delivering the customer database, and expenses incurred by the PUC in conducting regulatory activities with regards to the E911 surcharge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tadinko. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. S Stephen Conran from ITE. Uh, you're welcome to provide your, written te your oral testimony Please introduce yourself before you begin. Okay, good morning. I'm Steve Carrara from it and &E, and uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, uh, we welcome the opportunity to provide comments here on this very important issue. Uh, you know, I'd like to start with 
one issue that uh, Dan noted is we are about to spend a lot more money to upgrade our systems to comply with, with the next generation uh, 911 protocols. Uh, we want to make sure that the proposed cap doesn't in any way limit uh, that, op that ability. It's going to cost at least a half million dollars. Uh, we would like to see a lot uh, more P PUC oversight over how the these funds are spent. Uh, this is a significant amount of money, and it's something that really Im Im impacts the whole community. Uh, there's an ongoing uh, procurement now to upgrade the system. Uh, it's been awarded to a contractor. Uh, there are follow-on procurements that, you know, we really don't know what, what the state of it is, and we look forward to working with GFD better to understand what the process is and, and participate uh, directly in that process. Uh, as far as the administrative fees, uh, I th we would prefer to see a, a higher cap. Uh, we don't think it's necessarily, uh, we're running somewhere between less than five and sometimes over five because it depends on the amount of prepaid numbers which affects the collection. So in the pandemic, the prepaid numbers were down, so there were a lot, there were fewer collections for 911 because usually you have a bigger bucket there. So. We don't, we don't see it as a problem. Uh, we, our costs are, are fairly limited to the administrative cost, including the billing system, the people on the collection side. Uh, we really don't see any issue in terms of uh, that figure being, I don't know where the 15% came from. Uh, I think that's probably very high. Uh, again, but we're not seeing that, so we don't necessarily see that as an issue. Uh, but we would certainly, as Dan mentioned, uh, uh, we need more interaction with GFD and, and see what they're doing on this program so we can make it work better for, for the community, for everybody, and, and the carriers, because, you know, we bear a big portion of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carrera. Uh, now that the panel has presented their testimony, I'm going to open it up for any senators that might have any questions or comments, and I'll begin with the main sponsor, Senator Tidegui. If you have any questions or comments for the panel, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for being here to testify. Um, it's obvious that we, you know, based on the comments that were made here today, that I think a roundtable would be um, in order right now to, to go over some of these uh, comments that were made uh, to make sure there's a win-win. But, you know, as far as PUC is concerned, you know, it's the same PUC that decides the rate on power, you know, the same rates for other things at the port. And there's nothing that would stop this legislature from making changes to rates, especially when the law was created to collect this kind of uh, fee in law, in Guam law. So nothing stops us from changing what the Guam law says. What we want to do is make sure that there's fairness across the board. But when you start seeing other jurisdictions, you know, only charging 2%, you know, 3%, and here in, in a report, whether it was done in 2010, doesn't make a difference. If, we, if I finally got some information from PUC on what is being charged currently, how much percentage is taken out and not given to the Guam Fire Department to continue to do what the law says and cover their emergency system. If I had that information, I would have brought it here, but unfortunately, PUC refuses to give me that information on what percentages has been taken out in the last, let's say, 2022, 2021, 2023, because it fluctuates so much. Whether there is a state that has over, you know, two million people, there's a percentage taken from that to cover any kind of cost. Guam doesn't have that many people, but there's a percentage that's taken to cover the cost for these carriers. To what? Administer the funding? So a company, I'm not going to name a company, but a company com takes a dollar off of every charge. That dollar is then given to... GFD to cover their 911 and then administrative cost for that carrier. The administrative cost. When you were talking about a new system that's going to be put in place, I greatly appreciate that. Technology is moving so quickly, making things a lot easier. But to expect that dollar to cover your expenses as a business, um, I don't think so. <laughs> 
Um, my concern to uh, Mr. Recky is you brought the Organic Act of Guam into play on, this, on your comments. Are you saying that if we were to pass this bill that we are um, jeopardizing the Organic Act or that we are going against the Organic Act? Thank you. For Sen the record. Thank you, Senator. Uh, under the Organic Act, we, the PUC is an independent rate-making authority. Mm -hmm. And the legislature has already delegated these issues to the PUC, including the expenses for the providers and the surcharge rates. So I have to say in general, of course the legislature has broad powers, but if you look at the way the system is set up, the PUC is supposed to be the body that determines all these type of issues when it goes to rates, when it goes to uh, expenses allowed, that is an area that the legislature, if it wishes to be consistent with the Organic Act and existing law, it should not be involved in. That, that is how I read those provisions. And I, I wanted to respond to one thing. You said the PUC hasn't provided you with information. That is not correct. You wrote me a number of months ago. Right. I provided you extensive materials, everything I could find on it. And the most recent determination we have of what percentage the uh, administrative expenses re uh, represents is 2011 to 17. And in that, uh, I found in looking over the history that it, it's approximately 6.5 to slightly over 7% that constitute the administrative expenses. Uh, that is the best information I had available, and I've yeah. provided that in my testimony. Yeah, about I also hundred. did today, or previous to today, I asked each of the carriers to come up with their figures, which they've done, as to what their administrative expenses are. So I, I feel the PUC has provided information and has cooperated fully. Yes, thank you so much for that, Mr. Recchi. In fact, I uh, received 199000 is what was collect collected, but it didn't break down the years on how much every year you would take, the, they would take a certain percentage. Was it 5%? Was it 15%? Was it 7%? So breaking it down in every year and just showing the inconsistency of what money is uh, taken out and not given to GFD, the, you know, it just, there's an inaccurate data that's been provided to us. So hopefully during a round table discussion, we can sit down and actually get those numbers and, and look at them to make sure there's just fairness amongst it as we move forward. Well, Senator, our figures are consistent pretty much. They don't vary that much from year to so year. So you're saying so it never fluctuated? Every, every year it seems to have been that we, that I have been able to uh, get the data 6.5 to slightly over 7. The collections in recent years have been very stable too. Generally, two million to recently, it's always over two million, and recently, 2.2 million. Okay, thank you, Mr. Recky. Um, again, um, my concern was just the the lack of information, and I think a roundtable uh, is is definitely in order to come to fruition. Especially, Mr. Kelly, you brought up the information uh, some. Do you have your copy of your testimony? Was it provided? No, it wasn't. Uh, I didn't get Dan Tidingo's testimony. I appreciate if you can. Uh, I'll email it to you. Mine's a To all senators, please. Sure. Yeah, so they have a copy of it. And um, it mentioned about what exactly the E911 um, is supposed to be used for. You, you sure. elaborated on that. Okay, yeah. And, 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 but the law, if you look at the law, what it was created on, on this and what it could be spent for, and it does carry quite a bit of different areas. Can you just a little bit elaborate well, on that? Well, first off, just uh, let me make a couple quick comments on my background. For 20 years, I have been a uh, certified emergency number professional with Nina, which is the standards organization for 911 systems. And the bill you're talking about was actually written by Carlotta Leon Guerrero in, uh, I think we did, and I say we, because I was, uh, collaborated with her and uh, her staffer then was Nestor Lacanto. We wrote the law at that time based upon what was valid at that point. And it is supposed to cover 
the actual cost of collection. At that point, there was very little cost for carriers to provide 911 because we did not have the uh, geolocation. It was primarily just a connection through GTA, and those uh, were put in. As we're moving forward now, as been stated by the carriers, there's going to be a lot more cost to the carriers. The federal government, both in code and regulations of the Federal Communication Commission, allow the direct costs that are exclusively used and commercially reasonable for providing 911 service, including the equipment software that's exclusively for 911, the interconnection fees, to be a reimbursable expense out of 911 collections. Something, if it's not exclusively 911, it should not come out of the 911 fund. Actually, something that concerned me that the chief said is they're using this fund for emergency services and fire services. It cannot be other than maybe the dispatching of it, but the actual fire and emergency medical services should have their own funding mechanism. 911 should be exclusively for operating the PSAP, operating the equipment for the 911 system, and what the carrier's expenses in putting into the 911 system. And we can get into that in a round table and I can maybe help define this, but that's what the federal law says and we need to be consistent with that in what we're doing here also. Um, Maybe I confuse things instead of no, answering. No, no, no. I don't it, know. It, you were clear. You were clear. And thank okay. you so much because, you know, times have changed, you know, from that since the law was written. And, of course, we're here to uh, adjust to that time. But, but I do want to make sure that we provide, and I put this in the testimony and we can get into more detail, that carriers should have the availability to use 911 funds for those things that are exclusive. Now, one thing that I did put in here in the testimony also is Taito has got the contract with GFD to do the 911 system. I certainly think this was a good decision because I don't think the government of Guam or the fire department has the expertise to maintain the current technology required in servers for the next generation 911. That being said, they have contracted to Taito to provide the services. This overall is good but Taito does not have an oversight on what they charge carriers for connection mm -hmm. or what, in matter of fact, they're charging DFD coming out of the fund. Mm -hmm. And Taito is providing telecommunication services. And under the Telecommunication, Telecommunication Act of 2002 of Guam, anybody providing telecommunication services or reselling them must have a certificate of authority. And I question whether we should not require that of uh, Taito, since they're providing this to all of the carriers and GFD, and also add an oversight of the commission on this. And then maybe the commission can address the certificate of authority. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Madam Chair, yet, uh, the recommendation to, is also to have a round table uh, that we spoke about earlier. Looking forward to that. Uh, uh, Chief Stone, if there's nothing you want to say, anything you want to say at this point, but I do want a copy of yours. I know you have a hard copy. If I can get a copy of that right now, I appreciate it. But other yes, than sir. that, I appreciate uh, the opportunity and uh, for you to be here. It's about making Guam a better place to live and, and a safer place to live, too. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Tigri. Senator Brown, do you have any questions or comments? Sorry, I have to note the obvious. Welcome to my Republican colleagues. Good morning. This is what it was like when we had a Republican majority. We actually showed up to hearing. I don't know where the rest of our Democratic colleagues are a week after the election, but here we are. I do note the important thing that is brought to light here because I think at the end of the day, we really want to know how much of the E91 money is actually going to the Guam Fire Department. Obviously, the biggest priority is ensuring that uh, the service is available. And we understand the upgrades are being put in place. And yes, we know the history, you know, money being diverted and the government's nothing new. Whether it's right or wrong, it's not as uncommon as we'd like to think. And I was there, I'm sure, when we voted for this bill to uh, create the uh, E911 system uh, so that we have, you know, reliability with regards to our community to be able to get the services when they need it. Obviously, these things are life, actually a matter of life and death. I'm sure, Chief Stone, you will agree. So. I, th I think we can appreciate that. Um, obviously also, at least in listening to what has come out this morning, there's obviously a need to further discuss this issue so that at the end of the day, we know exactly how much money can go 
to the Guam Fire Department and actually what the costs are involved for the carriers that are having to provide the service. I mean, at the end of the day, as a consumer, I get a, I get a bill and it can have a whole listing of all the things I'm paying for, like my power bill or my, you know, uh, but yet I pay a single amount at the end of the day. So all that goes into listing out those bills, do I know? No. As a customer, all I know is I pay, you know, probably more for this than I actually pay for my power bill, believe it or not. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but... Uh, with regards to uh, your work, Chief Stone, and the money that you're getting, because it's not a, you know, when you actually look at the amount you're receiving, it's, it's not a lot. I mean, for what, what, the, what the need is out there. Where are we with regards to procuring the new system? How far away are we from that being in place? Thank you for the question, Senator Brown. So uh, the good thing is um, the project is, uh, is well underway. As a matter of fact, uh, just this past month, uh, in our new call space, we were able to have uh, all the furnishing associated with the call center and the, and, uh, the needs of it uh, installed. Uh, the week of December 5th, we actually have our uh, computer-aided dispatching um, contractor coming out to do the install for the, uh, the software and, and the associated uh, computer hardware that goes along with it. Um, so we're moving along pretty well. I mean, obviously, uh, we wanted to uh, cut over from our legacy system uh, to the next gen system by the end of the year, but unfortunately, our vendor has also been plagued with the supply chain challenges that we've been experiencing throughout the nation. So, uh, so that has slid right a little bit as far as uh, launching. Uh, we are anticipating um, by Q1 uh, of next year for them uh, to be able to cut over from the next gen. I'm mean, a correction from the legacy E911 system to our next gen solution. Do you, do you, are you given on an annual basis any information with regards to the breakdown of the revenues that are collected for E911 and what's actually going to the Guam Fire Department? Or are you just given an annual amount and said, well, this is what you're receiving to administer the program? The, uh, the latter is correct, uh, Senator. Yes, so we just get a basic, uh, this is what we're getting. Do you think the PUC should provide a report that lists out what those amounts are just so that you have that for your reference? Because I guess the issue is when this came up a few months ago was, you know, even to our awareness is the inconsistency. I mean, every, every business has their way of operating, but, you know, you do have to wonder what, what is the difference between, you know, why is one maybe 5%, one 7%? you know, and their operational costs. Why is that? I, I mean, I would have that question. That's something we would want the PUC to ask so that we don't have a fairly high amount that we're kind of questioning going, you know, to administrative costs versus the actual money going to the E911 system, which is ultimately why, you know, this fee was put in place. Right. And so to your question, uh, Senator, I think it would be, you know, it doesn't hurt to have more information. I will submit that I, I, I don't know the line of business of our telco providers and I, and I won't pretend to try and get in their lane of business. Um, at the end of the day, I know that uh, we want to be able to support this system. We do not want to return to any to any remnants of the state of affairs we've been existing in with our legacy system, um, even though there's been several attempts to try and, uh, try and uh, upgrade the system. Um, at the end of the day, I just want to make sure we're providing the best service to our community. Do you have any ongoing dialogue with, with the PUC concerning your E91 funding uh, at all? So to Mr. Herkey's call, no. Uh, I would be um, less than <laughs> if I said I'd had any conversation with the PUC other than casual conversations uh, when I've met some of them. Out in, um, out in the community. Is there anything as a result of this hearing you'd further inquire uh, that Mr. Hirecki has mentioned perhaps because the Guam Fire Department has not directly brought that issue to their attention? Uh, I, I, would, I would submit that that's, that's a fair uh, comment and then I'm, I'm actually in agreement with Senator Tello's, um, uh, Senator Tidegui's um, offer of having a roundtable discussion so that we can continue to have better, so we can better the dialogue, I think. I think that's kind of what's been missing. Um, and then, uh, you know, GFD will own some of that as well. But uh, just some of the information that we get is very, uh, is very straightforward. Uh, we don't know what the, the actual administrative costs are associated with those collections. We just get what the amount is that's collected and remitted to us. Well, I think it would be good to know because, you know, we certainly don't want uh, to get to the point. And, of course, others will say, well, the alternative is you simply raise rates. And right. We've been doing that in a time of, you know, we're, we're not where we need to be in our economy. We're certainly not where we were several years ago. And as the, you know, federal money dries up, I think we're going to see that reality. But I think we ultimately are going to want to know exactly how much of that is actually going to the E911 program and how much is going to administrative costs. So yes. I think that would be helpful. And I agree. I, I think we need to have a roundtable. 
Mr. Arkeek, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, you, you were referencing you had information up till 2017 with yes. regards to, you have no current, anything more current yes, than thank that? Yes, thank you, Senator, and I'm, I'm glad to uh, tell you why. Okay. So for years, every year, the PUC prepared a report on E911, and we had exactly the information that, that you've mentioned, the total collections, the administrative expenses by carrier. And what the PUC would do would be to hire a consultant. The, the PUC is not, we're not an e economics organization that determines that kind of thing. This is an accounting function. So we'd hire an accountant and we'd prepare and issue an annual report which set forth that exact information. However, the legislature deleted the requirement from the law that the PUC prepare an annual report. So in 2017, we advised the speaker, the governor, um, OPA, I believe, that that requirement was no longer in the law and that the PUC uh, would no longer prepare such reports. And I would say, I don't think the PUC is the right body to do that work because, again, we just have to hire an outside consultant. And those fees, by the way, are always deducted from 911. Uh, it, it ran about fifteen to 20000 a year. So whenever we hire a consultant at the PUC, then those expenses come out of the, of the collection. So I don't really think we were the appropriate body, but that's, that's why we stopped doing it. Well, I, don't, I wasn't here in 2017. We'd have to go back. I don't know what the logic was in doing that. Maybe to reduce the cost, I have no idea. Uh, but I think it would be good on an annual basis to still have that information collected and maybe in the course of um, the round table, maybe it could be determined. I don't know who else would do that research outside of the PUC. We don't we have any other entity, right? But uh, I, I appreciate you elaborating on that because at least that provides some clarification with regards to it. Uh, and again, for the carriers, I mean, we understand. I mean, there, there's additional work involved in doing this and I, I again we just want some sense of reasonableness and some closer degree of consistency uh, in what those rates are because I don't I don't you know how do we come to that determination I mean, if I'm going to determine I could keep you know well let me add this and add this and add this and this and this because I get to charge it and I'm going to be reimbursed so I might have a tendency to want to just add a few more things that maybe the next carrier's not I don't know but I, I think that's something we still want some sense of transparency and, and accountability with regards to these particular funds. Could, could I add one comment? I think the, the expenses and the collections have been pretty constant the last few years. Our, re, my research indicated about 144000 a year for the administrative expenses. But when you talk about collections of $2.2 million, that means still there's over $2 million that actually goes to 911. Well, but again, it's also been brought up that, that the upgrading to the new system is going to cost even more money. And if that's yes. going to be extracted out of the E91, you know, is that going to be how much and what's going to be left after? I think those are very exactly. important questions that need to be asked and answered so that we actually know at the end of the day, in this particular case with this upgrade, uh, what's going to be left in the system. Because the alternative is in this climate, oh, let's raise rates again. That's the solution. You know, I'm sure our, our community is not going to be as welcoming with regards to that. You have something you want to add? Yeah, I wanted to make just one comment. Having been very involved in the writing of the bill that established the 911 fund when it was introduced by uh, uh, Senator Leon Guerrero, we stated in that law that there may be shortfalls in the collections for the actual expenses and operation of the uh, PSAPs, the 911 centers and equipment. And what was in the original law was that the budget for the fire department would be reviewed by the PUC and if there is a shortfall in the funding of the dollar that that would be forwarded to the legislator for additional funding from the legislature. We knew there would be times that there would be shortages like during an upgrade like this and there's also by the way federal grants that are sizable and so on that can go to this also and by taking the grants plus the collections and then maybe some additional funding that makes it whole so let's not look at the one dollar as the only thing available to fund our 911 system 
I appreciate that, but I don't get any impression that any or much of any dialogue of that has been happening unless somebody else can enlighten me. I don't. Well, I don't that's gauge because, that. as uh, Attorney Horecki said, they took away the oversight of the budget of the fire department, which they used to have. Uh, I think this was taken out on a bill that was by Senator Ada when he, uh, after he had been governor, came back to the legislature. He was petitioned that the fire department didn't want to submit the budgets to the PUC. And the whole purpose of that was so if there's a shortfall, that could be forwarded to the, in fact, there was supposed to be an annual report on the budget to the legislature and to the governor, and that was taken out, uh, I think it was around 2002, I don't remember the exact date, but to me that was a, uh, not a good thing because I felt we still needed to have that budget reviewed to be able to make shortfall notices to the legislature and uh, that was taken out. Well, I mean, the dialogue this morning does bring to light that there are a lot more questions uh, as a result of it. I mean, ultimately, as I mentioned, uh, the intent is to ensure we can still fund the E911 system. So I look forward to, uh, you know, if it's this legislature or the next one, whichever, uh, that we do have the dialogue. Uh, and probably we can also, since we also have the opportunity to request to the public auditor, maybe just request an update. Uh, and have a new audit report done on what these expenditures are so that we can, we can get a more current figure with regards to that. Thank you for coming to testify. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to have questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, it, I pulled the gentleman to my right, and uh, including one of the co-sponsors, Senator Tony Atta. Um, did you have any questions? No. So the, the three gentlemen don't have any questions or, ca or comments for the panel. Uh, welcome, Senator Duenas, also. So with that, we are going to uh, call, uh, yes, uh, excuse me, Senator Tidegui, you are, um, you're welcome to make closing remarks before just we short. call this to order. Yeah, just short, I do realize there are other bills ahead of us. Uh, um, I do like, to, for the record, um, that uh, this bill be held off, and uh, we have that roundtable discussion first before moving forward, so I ask the committee to uh, please hold off on um, placing this bill forward until we do. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Looking forward to seeing okay. you soon. Duly noted. And with that being said, I want to thank all of you on the panel for coming today to testify and those who have submitted written testimony as well. Uh, we will now consider Bill 308-36 duly heard, and we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which will be Bill 331. Thank you, everyone. And we will just take a, a moment's recess while we gather the uh, information for Bill 331. The next item on our agenda is Bill number 331-36 LS, which was introduced by Senator James C. Moylan. It is an act to amend section 6206 of chapter 6, title 4, Guam Code Annotated, and to add a new section 6206-2 to Chapter 6, Title IV, Guam Code Annotated, relative to establishing penalties for agency heads who fail to comply with the compensation increase mandated by statute for any employee promoted competitively or by reclassification or temporarily. We have this morning uh, Senator Duenas, who will be presenting on behalf of uh, Senator Moylan. So I now welcome Senator Duenas to make your opening statement. Thank you. Sidious Masi, Madam Chair, and just for the listening public and those that are here today, Senator Moylan is in D.C. Uh, currently receiving training uh, as per his election to Congress. So I'm just going to read uh, his um, statement, sponsor's statement into the record. So basically it uh, goes as follows. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak on Bill 33136. For many years, hundreds of government employees, including firefighters, law enforcement employees, and others, have been detailed to work positions above their pay grades. The practice of detail assignments, if held for over 30 days, should provide for differential pay. Unfortunately, these employees have not received them. The practice is more commonly used as it's considered more cost effective as opposed to going through the merit system. The sad reality is that these detailed employees are often denied the compensation they earned and are more often 
than not deprived of the grievances filed or the government filing to hold a hearing. This bill simply provides for checks and balances for such details. It is important to note seven that detail involves an increase in job duties, which in some cases temporary eight promotion, which may last for months, if not years, and hence is paramount that nine employees obtain the differential. The act merely establishes this balance by 10, placing the onus on the agency head to assure the detail employee is 11 properly compensated in accordance with the law. Thank you, and I look forward to the hearing from the panel. I believe as the sponsor's statement was written, it is the sections in the law that are being referred to uh, in terms of steps and other detailed assignments. So with that, that is the sponsor's statement, Madam Chair, and I look forward to hearing uh, from, he looks forward as well as we look forward to hearing from the representatives who are here today to discuss this bill. Seduce Masi, Madam Chair. Seduce Masi, Senator Chris, and we have today signed up to testify orally, Mr. Edward Byrne, and Shane uh, Nata, are you also going to be uh, providing oral testimony? Okay. So I'll, I'll have, invite you to begin your testimony. Please begin by introducing yourself, please, and uh, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, Senators. Uh, my name is Edward Byrne, Director of the Department of Administration. I'm here this morning with Shane Gutter, who is the Personnel Services Administrator um, and is responsible for running the Human Resources Department. The Department of Administration has some very serious concerns with this bill. Let me say from, from the beginning that it is certainly the view and desire and way of operation of DOA that uh, government employees should be paid for the work they do. And if they're working for whatever reason uh, above their uh, nominal pay grade, they certainly should be paid for that within the regulations. And the regulations provide for a period of detail to be, um, uh, you know, 90 days, um, and there is an opportunity for extension. That extension has to be reviewed uh, by, a and eventually, if necessary, granted by the Department of Administration but it shouldn't be haphazard. There is no excuse for it to be haphazard. Um, and uh, as I go through the bill, um, I find that the bill itself really doesn't deal with that issue. First of all, I believe this is mainly a legacy issue. Um, we will speak about it, or I'll, I'll ask Shane to speak about it in more detail in a minute, but we have come across some cases in some agencies um, where people are doing jobs above their nominal pay grade uh, and have been doing so for a period. We do not condone that. We wish to fix that as quickly as possible. Um, but I think you have to ask yourselves maybe, why did that happen? probably is the result of a budget constraint. When budgets are set, certainly over the last few years, budgets have been set based upon warm bodies. A detail takes place when, for whatever reason, the warm body isn't in the department. It, it might be a extended uh, sickness, or it might indeed be a long-term disability. The warm body is counted in the, in the um, number of people that are budgeted for, but the additional expense of detailing that um, uh, the, the person who takes that position is not budgeted for. It obviously makes sense for there to be room in budgets for that to take place. If an employee 
uh, feels aggrieved. There is a grievance. Uh, there is a grievance procedure. It's a well-established grievance procedure, and we follow it scrupulously. There is always the opportunity, and we will make sure that uh, this is made um, a more readily available to people. But there's always the opportunity for an employee to contact HR um, uh, unofficially, and HR will always help. We want to make sure that um, employees are well treated. DOA takes pride in making sure that employees are treated as they should be. The way to remedy this, though, is not to punish the agency director. In some cases, the agency director may or may not know this was happening, and I think in the case that uh, I'm thinking of, that the agency director didn't know it was happening until it was brought to his attention. And having been brought to his attention, it was brought to our attention, um, and, and DOA is working to, to deal with that. Frankly, it's hard enough to get people to step up to run these departments, to put barriers in the way um, that, and the way this bill is written, there doesn't seem to be any quasi-judicial procedure to the whole process. There just seems to be, um, I, and it may be an assumption, it may be, I, I really don't know how the process is uh, envisaged to work, but it just seems to be a, a jump to some kind of automatic, I mean, the word automatic is there, automatic reduction in salary without any process to know whether that was indeed warranted or not. DOA, as, as I said and I will continue to say, wants to make sure that um, all government personnel are appropriately compensated. In the case of a detail, we're asking a, an employee to step up and very often be their own supervisor. That's not a light decision. We don't take it lightly. And on the occasions um, and on the other side of this, uh, of this problem, we have another uh, autonomous agency that seems to have a large number of people on detail and we're trying to deal with that too. Uh, on, pe on being requested to review these, we are taking our responsibilities very seriously and trying to find out why the agency seems to operate in that way. So in conclusion, before I ask um, Shane to make his remarks, I, I want please, senators, you to understand that we, we will, DOA, will continue to operate to make sure that people, for whatever reason, whether it's a detail or some other reason, are appropriately compensated for the job they do. But the way to do that is to work through it methodically, not to place a, a barrier, not to, not to um, effectively create a disincentive for the agency director uh, to either look the other way or not deal with it, but to make sure that the dialogue between DOA and the responsive agency continues, and you have my assurance that we will do that. Thank you, Senators. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Uh, Shane, did you care to add to that testimony? You may proceed, but please introduce yourself first. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and the Senators. Uh, my name is Shane Nata. I'm the Personnel Services Administrator for DOA, Human Resources. Um, yeah, just to add a little to that, you know, uh, just looking in the bill and, and what the law requires, uh, you know, most of the processes mentioned, right, promotions, competitively, reclassifications or details, they all have um, their own procedures attached to it. Uh, the promotions in and of themselves, the competitive ones, uh, I don't observe any real issues on that outside of, you know, usual processing for budget purposes and GG1s and, and things. Um, reclassifications, um, when we do those, uh, generally departments move um, pretty quickly on them, right? Because it, it does take a while for us to get a desk, out, desk audit done and out and have findings, but it becomes official at that point. 
Uh, I think the details are, are kind of where a lot of the issue is, right? And um, especially over the last uh, four or five years, details, you know, a lot of uh, employees have been called to step up to other positions. Uh, in the past, DOA um, had relied on an AG opinion to go ahead and vet um, what we called promised compensation at the time. Right, um, and that allowed us to take these claims in and take a look at it based on what the employee is saying. Um, a subsequent AG had then rescinded it based on an updated opinion. Um, so we no longer had uh, a basis to do that review or ask departments to compensate employees based on our findings. So right now, let's say we do a desk audit on an employee and we do find that an employee has been doing it for uh, a more permanent basis and not uh, so temporary, um, we can we can mention that and, and have it documented, but DOA um, doesn't have the ability to compel the agency to pay them for that time. We're, we're looking at a prospective adjustment, right, to position and pay. So I think once, uh, once we lost the ability to, you know, ask the department saying, hey, these employees are due this amount of money for work performed, um, that kind of started making everything back up, right? And, you know, at times it's not, um, uh, our observations are, you know, in, in some situations, like when um, agencies aren't able to backfill due to budget shortfalls or whatnot, they, um, they do ask employees to step up. It does take them a while to acknowledge that, you know, uh, processes have to be followed to properly promote them. Uh, in those situations, you know, once it's brought to our attention, we try to rectify it pretty quickly. Uh, but outside of that, yeah, uh, in the last few years, um, it's been a lot of employees stepping up to do um, bigger jobs uh, based on the pandemic, but now we're starting to get, uh, I think, more of a feel of, of what's come out of that, right? Uh, there has been a lot of attrition, right, uh, in the agencies, and a lot of um, employees have, have been promoted. Uh, they've taken the helm, and they have been promoted, but I'm sure there are others out there that need to be addressed. So just to add to that, I think um, if there was a move to do something, it would be, it would be to clarify the process that employees could use to get to that end result. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nata. Uh, I'd like to ask the um, Ms. Senator Duenas, who's sitting in for Senator Moylan, uh, if you have any questions or comments to the panel. Sidhu Madam Chair, I wanted to make one clarification as I read the testimony verbatim. For those that are following along, maybe that are listening or may listen to the testament, testimony subsequent to this, for Bill 33136 LS, it is section one, and then on page two, the reference was for line seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. So that kind of encapsulates what is the findings here. Mr. Byrne, I guess my question would be, because I've had to deal with this a number of different times as being um, a cabinet member in the executive branch. I know that under my leadership, we always compensated individuals past the 30 days. You mentioned that um, it's generally may be a result of budgetary constraints. What concerns me is, is that um, I'm sure you've done this during the time that you've been the DOA director, and I'm sure the fiscal team has put in controls which allow for a reserve and and the like so that agencies operate within their budget. I know many agencies incur lapses to include the salaries of those who are not being promoted but are otherwise warm bodies. I, I, I don't know that I'm comfortable with that characterization of budgetary constraints, knowing the tools that you have available to yourself. And so I'd just like you to elaborate a little bit more on that because I don't think that that would be a legislative problem with having passed the budget in the way, because you could also come back to us uh, for supplemental if duties were to exceed requirements. You have transfer authority, you have many tools in the toolbox. So I just was a little concerned, because I don't, I think employees, and I know we have union representation here that might have testimony as well. I mean, it concerns me also that beyond that 30 days, there may be even Department of Labor complaints and things that can come subsequent to that if not compensated for. So, I just want you to elaborate a little bit more on the budgetary issue because I think you have enough tools to handle that. Uh, thank you, Senator, and thank you. Just, just to make sure there's no misunderstanding, um, I'm certainly not advocating 
um, anything different than the intent of the bill that people who do undertake these positions should uh, be so compensated. As, as far as the budgetary uh, comment is concerned, um, that, you know, that may be true overall when you're looking at the budget, but the, the transfer can only take place when one department has exceeded their budget and another department has uh, fallen short of their budget. Um, that generally can only take place um, adequately um, uh, after the end of the year when those budgets have been finalized or the actual expenditure against those budgets have been finalized. Uh, so, um, yes, you're right, there is a mechanism. The mechanism, though, uh, doesn't always operate at the point that it needs to operate. Um, and, you know, uh, agencies um, are always dealing with balancing budgets. And uh, I'm sure I see, indeed, from, from my department, there's a lot of reallocation between object codes during the course of the year as we try and adjust the budgets uh, to meet the very point that you made is that the, um, it's a budget and expenditure almost certainly will differ from the budget and adjustments therefore need to be made. Um, but that's not always very easy to ascertain, especially very early in the year because you really don't know, you're, you're operating from the budgetary assumption and you really don't know how it's going to turn out. With that, Madam Chair, I, I guess I would just close my line with this uh, statement. I can certainly um, understand your concern with the proposed remedy, but I guess I'll have, um, having been fortunate to have been uh, elected into office once again during the next budget cycle, I'm sure to bring this up because the fact is, is that employees who are going to underfill positions that they're assigned to past that 30-day requirement should be compensated and that should be part of the overall plan of any administration or any fiscal manager. With that, Madam Chair, Cesus Masi. Thank you, Senator Chris Duenas. Uh, we've, we're joined today by Mr. Robert Koss of the GFT and I will invite you uh, to provide some testimony as you signed up to provide written testi oral testimony today. Uh, please proceed, uh, begin by introducing yourself, please. Well, good morning, Senate. Uh, my name is Robert Koss, and I rushed down here as soon as I learned this hearing was going on. I'm sorry for not being here sooner. Uh, I actually approached many of you senators uh, personally uh, requesting for this legislation to be enacted. This, I work at the Guam Federation of Teachers, and this is probably my most frequently recurring grievance that's uh, uh, happening today. Um, it is our impression that uh, during this administration, uh, they have utilized the uh, uh, detail assignment process to evade promotions. In other words, we don't promote employees, we'll just detail them to higher positions as those positions become vacant. Um, that's my perception. I don't know that that's the policy or the official way things are done, but from where I sit, that's how it does appear. Um, why would they do that? Because a detail assignment is roughly half the price of a full-on promotion. So there is a savings there. Uh, it also keeps that employee in perpetual uh, uh, probationary status. Uh, they can be returned back to the, demoted back to their former position at any time, as long as we have them in a detail assignment. We brought these cases before the commission over and over and over again. Uh, we have received different responses. These are classification compensation issues. The remedy rests with DOA. CSC has no jurisdiction or it's not a detail assignment because they didn't document it, or it's not a detail assignment because it went beyond the allowable 90-day limit. Whatever the excuse might be in that particular instance, we have yet to prevail at the commission on this issue. And yet it is cut and dry. It is in both law and rules and regulations, twice in the law, once in 6 GCA, or 4 GCA chapter 6, and the other in 4 GCA at 4117, I believe. So, you know, it is both law and rule, and, and yet we see a non-compliance. Um, conversations with your agency heads uh, tell us that if there's no penalty, why should they bother to comply? And so, you know, this is the kind of frustration 
um, that I deal with every day. And because there does not seem to be um, a willingness to comply with the law and rules, uh, I come to you and ask that you uh, introduce legislation to tell us who these people are, all of them, so we can deal with the whole group at one time. I believe there are hundreds, if not thousands. Uh, I think it was a, a former fire chief testified at the Civil Service Commission that all of the firefighters are working above step. They're all working at a position classification higher than what they're paid for. Firefighter one, functioning as specialist. Captains, functioning as battalion chiefs. Lieutenants, running the fire station as a captain. This is, this is the way. And I think that the uh, fire isn't limited just to them. We see it in nursing, we see it in DOC. Um, many, many agencies are taking advantage of detailed assignments. And that's why I said it seems to be the policy of the administration that rather than to promote employees, just simply detail them when the positions become vacant. Uh, this allows management to skip the hiring process. It, it eliminates competition. Management can pick and choose their supporters to fill these positions. Um, there are a lot of reasons why we need the legislation. But I know that in talking to the senators, there was a pushback on the portion of the legislation that I asked for, which was the enforcement provision. I don't think that you will get cooperation from the administration without enforcement. And so uh, that's why I asked that it be there, because I've been told, if there's no penalty for breaking the law, why should I be concerned with the law? So it needs to be there. There has to be consequences for breaking the law. And so let's ask the agency heads not to change any rules. Just tell us who the people are who've been uh, uh, detailed and then we can ensure that they get paid. And uh, if they fail to do so, of course, let's uh, uh, provide consequences for that. Um, I, I didn't prepare a formal presentation. Like I said, I just came down here as soon as I found out about the hearing, but I am open to any questions that you have uh, about this issue. Uh, we do have one going on at GPD today. Uh, I just got the email back, said she received her response at step one. What do I do now? So another, we're bringing this one forward as a grievance. We've tried personnel actions. We've tried post audit. We've tried a lot of things, um, but nothing has yet uh, prevailed. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Koss. I'm going to um, now invite any of my senators to the right. Senator Atta, if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Shane, how many, how many individuals do you know are detailed to higher positions that haven't been compensated or have exceeded the 30 days? Do you have that number available? Uh, no, not currently, Senator. Um, we don't, um, you know, a lot of it, if it does happen, we, we get it at the tail end to process it, right, with the GG1. Um, so uh, there are some procedures in departments where they can plan for it, um, but a lot of times if uh, someone just left the department right away, they backfill immediately, but uh, we don't have a solid number on that right now. You know, and I heard both testimonies from you and Mr. Byrne about budgetary constraints and budget uh, issues. However, you know, these past uh, years, uh, I think the budget has been really workable, yeah. 800 million, 900 million, a billion dollar budget. So I think that uh, when we get folks that have been stepping up to the plate to do the job, I think it's the government's responsibility, fiduciary responsibility, to pay these employees what they are worth. You know, I own a private business, and I bet that if I don't pay my employees what I, is due just to them, my company would be taken to Department of Labor, I would face fines, penalties, and then I would have to pay the employee. I think government needs to be put in that same position to where they need to step up to the plate and start paying our people what, they're, what they have been detailed for. And I think it, it's this, you know, it goes back to this administration or previous administrations, whatever. It, it, let's start paying our people for what they, they worked. And I think it, it starts from the top down. And if the governor, the lieutenant governor, and every department head and agency that comes before this body for reappointment to the, the cabinet, I think that should be the 
the question of the 37th Guam legislature to ask every department head and agency, are you going to pay your employees what they've been detailed to or signed? And if not, hold them accountable. I mean, if private sector employees are held accountable to the, to the uh, public sector employers are held accountable to their employees, government should be held accountable as well. And I think that we need to be more transparent as to how many individuals are detailed to di uh, at different agencies and departments in higher positions than they, what they are being paid so that we can justly compensate them. At a billion dollar budget, I don't see a reason why, I don't see any reason why our, individual, our, our, our people can't be compensated. I'm not here to, you know, th this has been a long-standing issue. Mr. Koss has brought it up. And in the past several years, I have no reason to believe that budget is an issue. None whatsoever. Because if they can give pay raises to unclassified employees and department heads, then I'm sure we can give our classified employees what is due just to them in stepping up for a detailed assignment. And if the, our government does not want to pay these employees on those detailed assignments, then put them back to where they belong so that they don't have to have the stress and worries about what's going on in a department or agency and not being just compensated for it. So that's all I ask of you. And, you know, let, let's start... If you can't do it right previously, let's start doing it right. Let's start doing the people right. Let's do our government right to show that, yes, we are just and accountable and that we will be held to a higher standard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Adda. Uh, Senator Brown? Just for the edification of the public, I mean, we can assign an employee a step up for 30 days, if it exceeds 90 days, right, Department of Administration has to concur on it. For the department head would have to justify what, ex you know, extenuating circumstances exist as to why that employee should be continued in that position. Um, of course, the employee cannot assign themselves, right? It would have to be the head of the department to make the request and authorize them to be placed in that position for that period of time. Um, so why is there difficulty in addressing compensation? Because if there's an issue of budget, then perhaps that department director should not have asked that employee to step up to the plate if they're not going to compensate them. Because it really puts the employee at a tremendous disadvantage. You know, they're being asked to perform the work. Of course, there's always a hope, wow, maybe this gives me an opportunity for more experience. I can add this to my resume. Maybe hopefully I'll be considered for that promotion. So I can understand from the employee's perspective, uh, why they may do it, but at the other end, if they're not simply being compensated once they exceed that time frame, uh, why is that? If I can ask you, Mr. Burns. Well, there really is no difference between us, Senator Brown or Senator Ida. We, we at DOA entirely agree that no one should be asked to do something um, above their the, 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 the position for which they applied for uh, and uh, were, were granted, no one should be asked to do anything beyond the, as you say, the, the 30 days. Sometimes there is a matter of degree, and it has happened that an employee will take upon himself, this, to, this is a response to what people, you know, why um, some people uh, get, um, they can't appoint themselves. Sometimes diligent people take upon themselves a task which isn't in their job description because they feel that's the right thing to do. Sometimes they don't tell either their supervisor or the head of that department that's what they've done. It just, it just happens, right? We encourage people to speak up. We don't want people to uh, do this work, um, especially if it's not compensated. And anybody doing additional work obviously should uh, verify that that work is actually needed um, or, 
or authorized before they actually do it. But it, it but the, the, the but general pr principle, that you know, it shouldn't happen. You know, we're, unfortunately, people are, are all human and, the, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily black and white much as we'd like it to be. There are uh, shades of gray as to whether somebody is doing something beyond their job description because a job description cannot be uh, fully authoritative. That just can't happen, um, either in the public sector or in the private sector. But, but in general, there's no difference between us. We want people to be paid for the work they do. I understand, but I'm saying if, if I mean, I, I can appreciate an employee who might say, oh, I should be doing this or I want to do this. That's a little different than I would look at it differently as a head of an agency versus specifically being tasked officially to fulfill that responsibility. I mean, that, there's got to be a formal mechanism. I mean, you know, I might argue I come to work an hour early. I should be paid for that hour. Well, if I didn't request you to be there for that hour and I've not tasked you to perform a job, uh, you know, you might argue, oh, no, you've got to compensate that employee. Or, you know, if you're asking them to come in 15 minutes earlier, you've got to compensate them. But if it's something specifically that's been uh, requested, then obviously there's an obligation. If it's a formal request for them to, to step up to a higher task or higher position uh, to assist or fulfill a, the mission of the agency, then by all means, it should be the responsibility of that department head who's authorizing that to address the proper compensation. Yeah, we all work with deadlines, Senator. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, nobody wants to miss a deadline and uh, incur the chance of not getting a grant, not getting the authority to, to do something that um, we are required either by federal or local law to do. That's not a reason for not compensating people. I'm, I'm just... Um, uh, I guess demonstrating that it isn't, a, it isn't black and white, it's a gray area. No matter how hard we try, um, we won't always be able to, I guess, uh, come down on the right side or the wrong side of a line. Um, and and in, in response to um, a comment earlier, um, before I got to the department, uh, and in one of the employees of DOA was uh, asked to work overtime um, and that wasn't reported. Um, and by that time I had arrived at the, at the department, it was reported to the US Department of Labor, it was investigated, um, and because the uh, employee did in fact work those hours, we did pay the employee plus whatever um, penalties we had to pay to the US Department of Labor. So it's not like these things don't get corrected. Um, the mechanisms that Mr. Koss referred to may not always correct them very promptly or very um, thoroughly, but there are mechanisms there. And speaking for myself, um, I'm sure most agency directors comply with the law whether there's a penalty or not, because that's what we have undertaken to do. And that's certainly the case at, uh, at DOA, as far as we're humanly possible to do. Well, I mean, aren't there procedures in place with regards to overtime requests? I mean, in departments I've worked at, normally it's the head of the department that would authorize overtime requests. Again, there should be a paper trail. If, yes. if, you're, if you're formally appointing someone to a position, there should be a paper trail. I mean, yes. it's the department director ultimately that's approving the, the you know, the, the uh, payroll. So uh, what, yes. what is missing there? Uh, I agree. Well, this happened uh, before I got to uh, DOA. It happened some, some years ago. But uh, from what I understood at the time is that uh, the supervisor simply said, you know, do this job, work whatever hours that this job takes, but don't report it on your timesheet. And that obviously was an inappropriate, illegal thing to do, and it was dealt with through the legal system. Well, that's unfortunate, because who's paying for that? Who's paying for that mistake? Mr. Kosh, you seem to want to make a comment. Yes, thank you. Um, oh, two more minutes. Uh, I, I just want to let you know, it might be unfair to put Mr. Burns and DOA under the hot seat here. Um, when the agency heads are not making the formal request. These employees are being detailed by memorandum only, which is the first step. 
Uh, they begin their work at 30 days. That's when a request for personal action should be submitted to BBMR and approved by DOA. Uh, it is a common fact pattern in these cases that the request for personal actions are not being requested and the uh, DOA may have no knowledge uh, that an employee has been detailed uh, and is due this differential pay. So, you know, with, uh, with that, I, I know that uh, Mr. Burns is trying to his best to field your answers, but I, I think the answer is they're not aware. They don't know that this is going on. And as far as agency heads trying to comply with the law, I'm not so sure. You asked about overtime. Yeah, overtime's being paid, but now a new problem has arisen where you're getting under the table CTO that's not being reported. It's not reflected on their paycheck. It's kept in the drawer. You might get it, you might not. So the overtime problem still exists as well. But that wasn't what uh, uh, was in my bill, but it's out there. It's just being done differently. Well, department directors, I'm sorry, department directors all have bosses. They all have regular cabinet meetings. They're not disengaged. I mean, you did endorse this current administration, so you know, it's surprising to hear that these problems are still existing. How ironic. <laughs> and I have all Republicans. <laughs> yes, I don't know where well, all the Democrats are. Should I be worried? Are. <laughs> but but it, it does bring to light that, that that it does bring to light obviously that there's a need for consistency with regards to how it's administered, which falls to me directly on the shoulders of the head of the department, because they're the ones that are ultimately responsible. If they're yes. if they're assigning an employee to perform this task, then they should be addressing the. It's not that complicated. I mean, you address no, I, payroll every two weeks. Every senator that has spoke has been right on, uh, spot on. Everybody uh, who spoke about the issue, I'm very pleased. It's what I'm hearing. I think you all fully understand the issues before you. Um, Mr. Burns, I think, uh, again, may not be fully aware of the magnitude of the problem. No, and I, and I don't expect him to run every agency, but I mean, the directors that are there should be responsible. Maybe, maybe DOE needs to re-enlighten the directors with regards to what the processes and procedures are, and outside of that, if they're not performing it, then by all means, they should be held accountable for it. Thank you. It's not that complicated. I mean, you know, it's... <laughs> All right, with that, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to comment and ask. Okay, I'll call on Senator Tidegui and then uh, Senator Blas, you'll be last. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have a question, Mr. Byrne. Have you received any information from the Guam Civil Service Commission on, you know, the practices that have been going on like this? Any recommendations that they provided you to not move in this area, that it's causing issues and could, could cause uh, potential, you know, uh, not conflict, but uh, ramifications, you know, on spending. Have they brought this to your attention? Uh, no, Senator, not me personally, but I'd certainly be happy for Shane to respond to that question too. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, we, we do converse with the commission staff, uh, especially with the uh, cases. Um, uh, if they do conduct an investigation, of course, we, you know, help uh, comply and help and cooperate. Uh, but yeah, on, on a policy level, I mean, I think <clears throat> both our agencies recognize that, um, like Mr. Koss said, there, there may be a gap in process somewhere or statutory authority to help all agencies come to an end result for the employees. Um, you know, like Director Burns said, we operate within our guidelines that we have, and it doesn't always come out to the result that is needed to rectify these issues. So um, it might take a longer conversation, I think, to try and figure so, it out. Yeah. So civil service, civil service has um, brought this to your attention on the issue and are, are making recommendations on how to cover that gap that you just talked about? Um, not, not formal recommendations, more so, um, you know, talking about the issues and, you know, how the rules apply and the laws apply. And <clears throat> I think it requires a longer sitting down to come up with a, a formal recommendation on Okay, that sounds like something that needs to be discussed, you know, and see whatever those gaps are so that we can, you know, plug those up and make sure everybody's on, on fair and equal, equal grounds here. So thank you. That's all. I just had that simple question. Thank you. Senator Blas, do you have any comments or questions? And then we'll follow up with a, a closing by Senator Duenas. Thank you, Ma Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for the panel for being here. And Mr. Costa, you know, nice observation. You know, Nobody up here got endorsed by you guys. Anyway, so. <laughs> um, but, you know, you know, Mr. Byrne, and, you know, I agree with Mr. Koss here that you're probably put in the hot seat here. Uh, and, unfortunately, you are the bearer of having to make the decisions or, you know, the paperwork's supposed to come to you, and, and it hasn't. 
but that said, it's, it's, it's maybe, you know, because you are the representation of, of the government uh, in this panel, wouldn't it be sufficient to say that in the case of detail pay or de detail assignments and stuff that the, there's a review of the budget and whether or not they, they exist within an agency's budget, um, the ability to be able to pay the detail pay if necessary? Yes, thank you, Senator. Yes, um, I'm well aware that m m my seat has varying degrees of warmth and sometimes it gets uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, you know, it's the department's responsibility to budget. Um, one, it's a budget, though. I, uh, that was the point. Uh, it's a budget and can't necessarily contemplate every circumstance that might happen. It, it happens, unfortunately, that um, a, several government employees, um, because of uh, long-term sickness for which, you know, one only has to feel sorry that, that they are suffering from this particular disease, uh, are absent from their positions for uh, extended periods. And, and sometimes those positions are key positions uh, within the agency. Um, and. The work can't stop. The work has to go on. Um, you can't really, um, I, I think, be too critical of agency directors for budget anxiety. Um, it, you know, certainly, you know, if you're on the fiscal team, you take these things with a little bit more, um, uh, I guess, uh, understanding because you're dealing in the fiscal field. But not every agency director um, uh, purports to be an agent, uh, a, a, a budget expert. And some agencies don't have um, the appropriate personnel to deal with the budget. They don't have uh, fully trained ASOs. Uh, nevertheless, right, um, you know, in, in formatting that budget, what might have been submitted um, in the executive budget to have included sufficient, uh, uh, sufficient funding to cope with this additional compensation that would be earned while the, while the superior employee is sick and the junior employee is doing that job and therefore being compensated for it, it may or may not be there or perceived to be there. We will certainly help and BBMI will certainly help that agency um, if, when we're approached, like Mr. Koss says, uh, you know, we, we're not all seeing, but we want, you know, if, when we're approached, we will certainly help, and both on the HR side and, and on the fiscal side. Um, uh, but it, it's not always fully um, foreseeable, or, and, and uh, there are circumstances where some, uh, some departments certainly you know, have exceeded their budget because of unforeseen circumstances like people retiring and getting lump sum payments or people um, unfortunately being sick uh, and being sick for long periods requiring uh, the necessity for detailing employees. Thank you to those employees for stepping up to the job. Um, we, I certainly would want to lose no opportunity to thank them for, for doing that job for, on behalf of the government. Um, but you know, as far as Mr. Koss uh, indicated, DOA will try and deal with whatever situation is presented and try and correct or help the agency. Um, we encourage every agency to tell us what they're doing with personnel because we feel responsible for those personnel you know, the HR department takes its responsibilities very seriously. No, I appreciate it. That's why, I, you know, between you and Shane, um, you are the receivers of, of the mess that had already been created. But thank you for, for the, you know, for, for your presentation there because I'm listening to, you know, I run a business myself. And, you know, you just ba basic business practices. One of the things that you got to worry about is you got to worry about your contingencies. You got to worry about the what ifs. Okay? But there seems to have been, 
over the last couple of years, just blatant nonchalantly move people around and we'll figure it out later. Okay? Uh, again, I don't, Mr. Byrne, intend, you know, to, to, to come down on you because it's not, you know, you're not the one doing it. You're not the, you know, you're, you're, you're not the, 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 the chief or the director of the other agency that constantly do, that is doing this. Um, but that said, is, is I sit here and I listen to the conversation and, um, and, and the presentation and the justifications in some cases of, of, of why this occurs. There's really no justification and there's no reason why an individual who is being tasked uh, to perform above step, you know, above their pay grade, above where their, their, their position title, and not expect, you know, compensation for that. It's, you know, I mean, that's common human decency. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would just hope that, and I have to agree with Mr. Koss. I mean, while you may say that uh, there are agencies that, you know, that we have to, they're, they're bound by the law and whether or not there are consequences or penalties or not, it doesn't seem to be that case, uh, especially over the last few years. Okay, um, you know, I can recall many conversations I've had with, with, with government employees who have been tasked from one agency to another, more specifically for pandemic response. Thank you for having them having the expertise and being able to move, you know, to, to take on those tasks. But there comes a point in time when, you know, the individual's got to be compensated justly for what they're doing. And to be, it's almost as they, the, the employee was taken for, it was taken for granted that the employee is going to continue to do this because they're going to get, the, you know, they're going to get a paycheck. It's not about the paycheck. Okay. And, and again, Mr. Byrne, there's no ill intent. I mean, I, I, I don't mean to direct this toward you personally or professionally. I know what you're trying to do at DOA. And I know that a lot of times you get, you're the bearer of this information in the back end and sometimes it's not good. All right, and you try to fix it. Okay, he just happened to throw you to the wolves today and I happen to be one of those wolves, okay? Um, but that said, I, you know, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the, 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 uh, the openness in this, okay? Uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Koss, for, 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 for bringing this up. Yes, I was one of those senators that he had this conversation with. So thank you. You had something to say? Yeah, it, it sounds like we're wrapping up. I wanted to make a closing remark. Um, I just want to remind the commission that the, uh, or I mean, sorry, the, the leg uh, Guam legislature, that the uh, function of the detail assignments is really to allow the department time to implement the merit system and fill positions by competition, a process of announcing, receiving applications, holding interviews, and then filling the position. And, and that's where the detail assignments really come in handy. Um, up to 180 days with the consent of the commission. I'm sure the commission would grant any agency the extra time if they needed it for the purpose of filling positions by merit system protection. But the consequences of doing it the way it's being done, uh, besides the obvious loss of public employee trust in their government and their employer, and public trust, whoever they talk to about this, um, is the... Uh, incentive for employees to perform well. Employees, we have called work by the rule, where you do just enough to uh, get a paycheck. And then we have other employees who go above and beyond, work weekends and above their hours. And their incentives are uh, the uh, uh, what a merit bonus and promotion. You took away, well, you didn't take away, but they're not getting merit bonus. and. Promotion is they're still hopeful, but when we're filling positions by detail assignment and not promoting employees, you take away that. So you take away the incentive for public employees to want to perform. There's nothing else out there for them. I might as well just do the minimum and get my paycheck. Why am I working so hard for no reason? So, I, okay, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Koss. Um, I'd like to invite Senator Duenas if you have any closing remarks. Just real quickly, Madam Chair, uh, Shane might remember this. This is not unprecedented. Uh, back in 2003, when the new public auditor came in, uh, quarterly reports were required by directors. 
both hard copy and electronically to be submitted, and failure of that was 10% doc from their pay. I know because I was director of youth affairs at the time. Fortunately, I didn't lose any pay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm glad you didn't lose any pay. Senator Duenas, you did a good job. With that being said, thank you to all who came to testify today on Bill number 331-36-LS. Bill number 331-36-LS is duly heard, and we will now move on to the next item on our agenda. I want to thank the panel members for your testimony and for the senators present today um, for your comments with regard. So the next bill that we're going to hear is Bill number 347. Bill number 347-36-LS was introduced by the Committee on Rules by the request of a Magahagan Guahan, the Governor of Guam, in accordance with the Organic Act of Guam. And we'll recess for just a minute while we gather up our, our documents. Good morning, everybody. We're going to proceed now with our next item on our agenda, which is Bill Number 347-36-LS, which was introduced by the Committee on Rules by request of Imagahagan Guahan, the Governor of Guam, in accordance with the Organic Act of Guam. This is an act to approve the Hagatna Restoration and Redevelopment Plan and its supporting documents. I invite the commissioners and the executive director of the Hagatna Re Restoration and Redevelopment Authority to have a seat at the table. Welcome, Ms. Leon Guerrero. Uh, when you're ready, I'll allow you, uh, the chair, Maria Eugenia Leon Guerrero, and I believe Director Lasia Casil is on Zoom participating with us, so she'll be admitted into the uh, conversation as well to make any statements. And uh, I'll now uh, allow you to begin with your opening statement, Ms. Leon Guerrero, and you may begin. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Senators. My name is Maria Wenya Leon Guerrero, and I am the chair uh, for the Hakatnya Restoration and Redevelopment Authority. Half a day, Honorable Senator Camacho Torres, uh, Senators, colleagues, friends, and stakeholders. It is my honor and privilege today to provide testimony in support of Bill Number 347-36, an act to approve the Hagatnya Restoration and Redevelopment Plan and its supporting documents. I am joined today in support 
by my fellow HRA commissioners, some of who could not be here with us uh, physically, but I will acknowledge them. My vice chair, Patricia Ada from Ada's Trust and Investment. Elizabeth Gale, civil engineer with Setiati Architects. Dr. Carlos Madrid, Micronesia Area Research Institute, who is with us today. Tenrita Franquez, Hagatnya resident and Saina of our board. Ms. Christine Wolk, managing partner at RIM Architects, who is also here with us today. Commissioner Felix Benaventi, independent consultant, former chief planner for land management and public works. Mr. Wes Cassidy from Cassidy's Associated Insurers and John Cruz, our Hagatnya mayor. Also uh, with us earlier, but they had to leave to a meeting, was Celeste Werner, who is Chief of Strategic Development with Matrix Design Group and has been HRA's main point of contact for the work done with the Hagatnya Master Plan. As we all know, Hagatnya has served as a center of government, culture, and commerce for Guam and the Marianas throughout many parts of its history, dating back to pre-Western contact through the Spanish colonial era and up through World War II. The vision for the restoration of our capital city was born in the hearts of, of community leaders who lived through the destruction of the war. There was a consensus among these leaders that our vibrant capital city must be restored to its former glory. The community leaders were humble yet worldly men. No doubt they had traveled the great cities of the world and understood the value that a well-planned, well-coordinated, and well-governed city can bring to the people and businesses that reside within it, as well as the wider economy that it is a part of. They understood the critical role that a capital city plays in the cultural identity of a people. These were the beliefs that united our post-war community leaders and led to the creation of the Hagatnya Restoration and Redevelopment Authority. To my understanding, the first formal attempt to develop the Hagatnya Master Plan was in 2005, though it was never completed. In 2014, an effort was initiated to update the 2005 Master Plan the update was near completion, but for whatever reason, the plan was not ushered through the formal approval process. In 2019, the current HRRA Board of Commissioners was impaneled, and we began the work of picking up where the former board left off. With new leadership in all of the Government of Guam agencies, much of our work involved understanding and socializing the elements of the master plan with key stakeholders. Though it proved to be a significant investment of time and effort, our Board of Commissioners understood and appreciated that without strong buy-in and support from key stakeholders, this effort would not be successful. The Master Plan is a broad community vision and is meant to guide decision-making related to land use, roads, housing, utilities, and other community needs in order to achieve its vision. It is a living document designed to adapt and flex as conditions and priorities change. Once the Hagatnya Master Plan is approved, it will open doors for eligibility for numerous federal programs and funding sources targeted specifically for community development. We appeared before this legislature back in April of this year, 2022, advocating for the approval of the Hagatnya Master Plan. Since that time, we have actively solicited your comments, questions, and concerns. For all those received, we believe that we have addressed them appropriately within the documents. The HRRA has been criticized as a non-essential government agency, an expendable luxury that can be easily eliminated when faced with more pressing priorities such as education and public safety. Respectfully, we disagree with this position, particularly during a time when our community is struggling to make ends meet we cannot afford to be short-sighted in our leadership. Certainly, we must address the needs of today, but we must also invest in opportunities that ensure the long-term sustainability of our economy. The HRRA's eneb enabling legislation requires us to develop a Hagatnya Restoration and Redevelopment Plan, which is what we are re-delivering to you today. The Hagatnya Master Planning effort was started during the Camacho administration it was substantially advanced during the Calvo administration. And with your help, we can carry this milestone over the finish line during the Leon Guerrero administration. What an opportunity for Guam to come together 
in support of a vision that has involved the input and collaboration of three gubernatorial administrations and across party lines. Our post-war community leaders knew in their hearts that restoring our capital city was the right thing to do for our government, for our culture, and for our economy. Nearly 78 years after our liberation, our position remains unchanged. The vision and the intent is the same. The master plan has been developed, vetted, and supported. It is our community's master plan to refine and evolve as we deem necessary. The time to act is now. I hope that you'll join me and my fellow commissioners in supporting the passage of the Hagatnya Master Plan. We are excited to put the plan into motion and set our capital city on a path to realizing its unlimited potential as a center of government, culture, and commerce on our island. Sidus Masi. Thank you, Ms. Leon Guerrero. Uh, it, I understand uh, your director is uh, on by Zoom. Is she going to make a presentation? Are you aware? Half a day. Oh, there. Can Thank you, you hear me? Lassia. <clears throat> Welcome. Hi. Please proceed. Uh, Thank you, um, Senator uh, Camacho Torres. Um, half a day and Andangulusi uh, um, honorable senators of the 36th Guam legislature, for allowing us to be present and speak in support of Bill 347 36 and the approval of the Hagatnir Master Plan and its supporting documents. The mission of the Hagatnir Restoration and Redevelopment Authority is to develop a plan that will promote, preserve, and protect the rich Chamorro heritage of our capital city of Agatnya, to develop affordable housing for our residents to return back and to develop economic opportunities for our people to thrive. <clears throat> In short, create a city to live, work and play. Agatnya was once the center of Chamorro culture dating back 35 to almost 4,000 years. It is the oldest city in Oceania was once the center of our government, as well as the center of Micronesia. It is the cultural destination of Guam and should be protected, promoted, preserved, and developed accordingly. As you are aware, the city was completely destroyed during World War II with all of the residents fleeing, all of our historic buildings destroyed, and very little restoration and reconstruction over the past 77 years. The few restoration and redevelopment projects include the Guam Museum, the restoration of the, and the restoration of the, of the Guam Congress Building. In the mid 1990s, a group of community leaders came together to form an organization to take the lead on the restoration of our beloved capital city. And Public Law 24-110 created the Hagania Restoration, <clears throat> excuse me, and Redevelopment Authority. These community leaders knew that without a plan to develop the city and protect its heritage and our Chamorro culture and identity, that development would be hodgepodge and much of the cultural and historical sites may be lost. The first attempt to create this plan um, was in the mid 2000s, 2006. Uh, it failed to launch and again in 2014, 2015, um, Almost a million dollars was invested to build upon that plan. Development of the plan began with community, community engagement and charrettes. An entire chapter of the, the, the land use plan is dedicated to um, the, the recording of all of this community engagement. And for anyone to claim that there has been a lack of community engagement is false and misleading. From those initial meetings, um, the map atlas was created, outlining the baseline from which we, could, we should move forward. The land use plan contains the goals and policies which will guide future land use and development decisions within, in Hagatnya. Uh, it also identifies actions that will be used to accomplish these goals and policies. The design guideline document was created to develop the unique sense of place for our capital city. It is these three documents that we are asking for you to approve. When I was appointed to the position of executive director in January 2019, I walked into a room in which a million dollars worth of work had just been tossed, disorganized into filing cabinets on top of tables. 
Um, it was just everywhere. There were no minutes, no recordings of any of the board meetings held um, prior in the previous administration. OPA has no records from HR prior to 2019. I consulted with the governor and she instructed me to work with a newly impaneled board of commissioners to reach out to all the agencies and stakeholders to re-review the materials and make sure we had all the supporting documents to move forward. I have to say that this board and its ex officio members represents the people in our community. It is comprised of local business owners in Hagatnia, residents of Hagatnia, local architects, engineers, planners, and historians that are entrenched in our community. It took us less than a year to resolve all the issues. So I, I take great pride in the dedication and to transparency and outreach that my board has done in such a short time. We reached out to the senators uh, for their input on this plan and received questions from the speaker, vice speaker and, and Senator Tello Taidegui. Thank you so much for your support. And I believe that we have responded in depth to all their questions and concerns um, many of which were mostly about the, the capital improvement projects, which we are not asking for approval or for, uh, for financial support um, today. I know there are concerns about the authority's power of eminent domain and our ability to change the zoning code uh, with just a public hearing. Uh, as an autonomous a uh, government agent agency, it is not within our power to change the existing laws. Uh, if these are um, legitimate concerns, I recommend introducing legislation to change our enabling law, um, but holding the completed Hagatni master plan uh, at bay because of something that we cannot control is not fair to the people of Guam. Um, another issue that has been brought up is the river feasibility study, which is required if we are to develop along the river. Uh, concluding this study is not a pre prerequisite to current development, as one can see from the Guam Museum, uh, the Guam Congress Building, uh, First Community Bank, which is being um, constructed, uh, the Guam Chamber of Commerce, which was done with, within the past uh, five years. Um, they are all being built to the current um, uh, uh, building codes. I know that, that during the budget uh, session, there were concerns about our ability to handle funds brought up. Um, and I just wanted to clarify why Gita was overseeing the contract to develop the Hogatni Master Plan, um, as it was the hot bond uh, which Gita administers. Um, and so that's why they, they, they were overseeing that project. In revising the current plan, I went through all the recordings of the public hearings uh, with the legislature took note of all the recommendations, all the issues brought up and incorporated them into this revised plan. We did hold a markup session. Thank you, Senator Tello for attending that session. Um, we did include your comments, uh, edits and revisions. I am proud of this piece of work and I think it truly serves the people of Guam. We cannot move forward without a plan and no plan is perfect as circumstances and conditions are constantly changing. But this plan is a living document, which is required to be updated consistently um, with changing circumstances and conditions. Therefore, we ask that you humbly please approve the Hagatnya plan without further, further delay. I, I welcome your questions and comments. Sidhu Ismasi. Sidhu Ismasi, Ms. Kassil. I'm going to uh, open the, the discussion up now to the panel of senators and uh, I will invite uh, Mr. Blas, uh, Senator Blas, if you'd like have any questions for. Uh, thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. But you know, Madam Chair, I'm a little discerned here. It's the only bill. It's probably the only time we've only ever had a public hearing, and we don't have any paperwork. Um, you know, and you're talking about a 300-page document. Um, and I appreciate, Ma'am, Ms. Leon Girl, your, your presentation, as well as uh, Ms. Casil. Um, but I'm looking for paperwork to see, to discern, so that I can, and uh, I really like some of the comments that both you and Ms. Casil had stated. Um, fortunately, it was a little hard to hear from her side, and um, I'd like to be able to reserve some of my comments until I can get some 
Is, do you have, is, this, is that going to be submitted as uh, your, your testimony? Yes, if, if I can interject, uh, Senator Blas, there is attached to Bill 347 36LS, and I apologize if you don't have a, a copy in yeah. front of you, the staff can bring one to you. Um, this bill, an act to approve the, the Haganya Restoration and Redevelopment Plan, uh, includes supporting documents, and there is basically three different documents that, are, that constitute the final plan, which is seeking approval through this bill. Uh, the first is the Hagatnya Master Plan. The second is the Hagatnya Master Plan Design Guidelines. And the third is the Hagatnya Master Plan Map Atlas. So just, uh, I just want to note that uh, to you, and I apologize that you don't have one in front of you, but we'll get the, that to you right away. And you may proceed, Senator well, Glass. Well, then if that be the case, is it very safe to say, Ms. Leonga, that uh, the bill is basically the... Uh, the exact bill that was submitted to the legislature uh, previously? There were some minor revisions based on the, some of the questions and comments that we received okay. from the legislature back at that hearing in April. Okay. And that's why, I mean, first off, I appreciate that. And if, if there were, I don't have a copy of it. Um, and uh, I was told I can get this, you know, get it online. It's just, I would like to be able to refer, defer some of my questions and comments um, until I get some of that information, okay? But thank you very much for the presentation, okay? Thank you, Senator Frank. Uh, Senator Brown? I think it would be helpful because it is an extensive document to provide us what those amendments or changes were. You know, I appreciate the, the interest, obviously. I mean, I was in the legislature when we originally authorized the creation of the Hagatnya Found to, to begin this process of um, revitalizing our capital. And I think a lot of us would love to see it. It's just a question of the comfort level in moving forward. And I think that was discussed earlier this year in, in not moving forward with this plan. So it would be helpful to provide that. I mean, you know, uh, the attacks and the criticism mixed in with the comments don't help the bill. Um, you know, we're not unenlightened. I mean, I think we all want to see the improvement to our capital. I think we have much to gain, including you know, enhancing the existing historical uh, landmarks that are down here that probably need more work and more restoration. And I think we all would see the benefit of that, not just for, you know, as hopefully our tourism industry comes back to the island, but just our community, our children that pretty much, you know, still have a lot to learn about our history. And I think we want to preserve that. And yet at the same time, still grow and expand. Um, you know, even though I, I do enjoy the quietness here on the weekends uh, when everybody is out of the capital. So um, it would be good and would be helpful because this document does not show me what changes were made to the original uh, plan that was presented to the legislature, this current legislature. So if we did have an outline of that to reference, it would be helpful because I'm not going to be able to distinguish that looking at this existing document. Um, I believe that a matrix was prepared showing exactly where the questions were and what, how we responded to them. Latia, can you please confirm that that was yes. submitted? An outline with all of the uh, exact edits was submitted to the legislature. So you can, it, 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 it's, a, it's a matrix that shows the comment, the page, um, what the previous, uh, what, what the, the um, old um, version was, and then what the new comment was. But we can email you another copy. Who, who, were they, who were they given to? Uh, it was submitted from the, the to the, um, from the governor's office, I believe, to the um, so attached to this version. clerk. You know, I, I, it's submitted to the clerk, and, and I think copies were distributed from there. But we, we, can, we can send you a copy of that. I'll email one over um, to be distributed again. Well, that would be helpful, because I, I don't see it here. I don't think Senator Tello has a copy of it either. She attended the hearing, so... I, I don't know where the disconnect was, but I think um, once we've had an opportunity to review that, I'd be more in a position to ask questions or respond. So, Madam Chair, I really have nothing more to add at this point. Thank you. Thank you, and I will uh, confirm with the committee the receipt of that and make sure that it is provided uh, as part of the, um, the documents, including all testimonies submitted uh, as part of this bill for the record for the 
the reference of uh, senators to an ample time. I'll now like to acknowledge uh, Senator Tidegui, if you have any comments or questions. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And uh, I, I, I did attend the meeting and uh, put some comments through that uh, I think that the most important one that I mentioned was having a round table, you know, having everyone come together, discuss, you know, not just the legislature, but agencies, as well as the community or businesses in Hangatya. But that didn't happen. Um, and I was very disappointed that we're here today looking at this measure and not having that round table. Um, and you, you know, Madam Chair, you, I, I did speak to you personally how important that would be, you know, moving forward and you know, just bring, providing more transparency, not just to the legislature, but to the community as well. I do, um, I did research some of the bill compared to um, bill 246 that was introduced and failed on the floor. And now uh, in its place at 347, there has been some changes. Um, it approves the master plan, uh, the Hagatnya master plan design guidelines and uh, the Hagatnya master plan map atlas. So it just takes in three of the four considerations of the last bill instead of all four or five. Um, uh, Bill 347, uh, the sections require a five-year review of the plan. You, there's so much more that, that my colleagues need to review on. I, I believe the, one of the board members lifted up and kind of showed us what that uh, document looked like, and I, I don't have that. but. Um, once we have that, we can have more discussions on it, but can you please, um, Madam Chair, if you can, explain the one section that requires uh, the five-year review of the plan? That's a bit different compared to the, the bill that failed on the floor on the Gott Master Plan, and then the section now requires a five-year. Can you can sure. explain? Yeah. Um, I can address that and then I can go back to your other comment about the round tables and the public input because there was a significant amount. So okay, thank for you. For the issue that you're talking about, um, Speaker Terlahi had s submitted a concern that um, there, is, uh, there is a part of the plan that says the HRA shall reevaluate the plan every five years or sooner. And her concern was what the cost would be moving forward should there be any edits or revisions to the plan. And she had requested, can we add in the introduction somewhere something to the effect that HRA is the owner of the document and has the authority to make any changes or revisions? Mm -hmm. And we did insert that HRA is the owner of the Hagatnya Master Plan, Land Use Plan, and has the authority by law to make updates to the plan as appropriate. And it, is, okay. it has always been in the plan that we would revisit it every five years or sooner if you know conditions change or the situation warrants. Okay, so that's what the five years is because I was looking Correct. through that real quickly and uh, and added in. Okay, um, I'm not going to belabor this any longer. I think we. Oh no, you were going to discuss about the round table. Yeah. From the time that I met with you with um, uh, my defunto uh, Rollin, the uh, Laverde, and I who attended your meeting. How many uh, round tables have you had since that time? None since that time. Uh, but I want to just, just state that the, the Hagatnya Master Plan has been a community effort from the beginning. So there are several round tape stakeholder interviews that were conducted in October 2014, February 2015. We had public charrettes, um, press releases, interviews, open house public workshops. Um, all of this happened during the, the Calvo administration when the plan was substantially developed. And that included um, senators, agencies, local businesses, local residents, all of that is documented mm -hmm. in the plan. Um, there's a section there that actually lists everyone who was interviewed um, for that. So th it was a huge undertaking. Um, of course, we paid Matrix to do that, so they did that. Mm -hmm. um, when we became impaneled in 2019, we sp our subcommittee spent an entire year during COVID 
going around to all of the agencies and soliciting input from them, making sure that, because they were all new leaders mm -hmm. in those agencies, so we spent a lot of time meeting with each of the agency heads, making sure that they'd read the plan, if they had any concerns, if they had any feedback for us, which we incorporated. Um, we put a lot of hours into that as a subcommittee. So the round tables that you're talking about, I feel they've been happening all along. We haven't had any between the last hearing and this one, um, but we've, as far as the current legislature, I know that we have provided the documents. I realize they're lengthy, um, but we have, we have done that. I know Lasia has reached out to many of you asking if you have any questions or concerns. So I do feel that we have given that opportunity um, and done so adequately. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And there is um, in no means, uh, and Madam, be, sorry, there is no means that I, I, I'm, I'm here, you know, be, not claiming that you, you've had other round tables. I mean, it's obvious the work that you've been doing, I've been staying on top of this and looking at the research that you've also provided. Um, but the whole purpose of a round table now is like you said, there are different leaders, you know, there is a different makeup in the legislature. Um, during the se during session, when we heard the first original bill 246, and the concerns that were brought up brought up on the floor, you know, they needed to be addressed. That's why it was so important when I came to see you that one of the first things I said was, we need a round table. Uh, that's fine. There have been round tables as we've been going for the last decade on this particular um, project. But I'm talking about now because we had a public hearing, we had a, uh, this bill on session, and there were great concerns that wanted to be addressed. And you, nothing, you know, there was no round table from may that I respond time until to now. Question? Okay, Lasia, is that you speaking? I think it is. Right? Hi. Yes. May I respond yeah, to your question? Sure. Please? Sure, Lasia. But let me just okay. let me just finish. Let me just finish. Okay. Okay. One of the concerns was eminent domain, the the taking of land. That this board had a power. This board has the power just to take land. You know that was a huge, huge concern. And. Uh, there, there was an, another issue on the boardwalk, you know, the, you know, moving forward on something like that. I mean, the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, all these things were not really addressed. And this particular bill still does not address some of them. I really, at this point, Lassie, I'll let you go next, but we need to have a round table. I've asked you guys to have that. And I think my colleagues here would like to hear that too as well. And we've got a whole group of, you know, new senators coming in into the 37th. And I'm pretty sure they're gonna wanna get updated on this. So um, other than that, can I go ahead and let Lasia sure. comment? Okay, and then you can comment yeah. after. Go ahead, Lasia. Thank you, Senator. Um, we did respond directly to your request for, uh, for a round table. I believe it was a memo sent. Um, I don't have it in front of me, I do apologize. Um, but we were advised by our legal counsel that because you, uh, the legislature rejected the bill and we would have to, um, you know, you, uh, we would have to introduce a new bill that, that uh, what was appropriate at the time was a markup session. So we were following legal counsel. Um, and then once the new bill is introduced, then we, would, then we could have a round table. So that, that is why we did not have the round table and, and it's, I did send you a, a, a memo um, after your request uh, responding exactly that. I think that it was um, outlining what the legal um, okay, verbiage well, was. Le legal cannot tell this legislature not to have a round table, number one. <laughs> You know, so that's, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. So, but I'm, I'm curious to see what your legal has to say and send it our way. Um, Madam Chair, please. Yeah. Okay, I just, uh, I understand the concerns that were raised in the previous hearing about the eminent domain, about some other powers that the HRA was granted in our enabling legislation that maybe um, this body was not comfortable with, okay? But I feel that that is a separate issue from this. If, the, if you senators aren't comfortable with that, then why don't you propose a bill to amend the original legislation? I don't think it's fair 
to hold this master plan hostage because you're not happy with something that was passed many legislatures ago. That can be amended. That's up to you. But this plan, it, it, it stands regardless of those authorities or not. And I, I think it would be a mistake to hold this hostage. We can open doors to funding and get things going because ultimately, as, you, as both of you stated, we all want, we all want this for our community. So why, why do we now have to hold this hostage because of, of that, you know, the, the original law? It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, uh, and, and I agree, but I, I don't think that we should move forward. If there is a mistake in a prior, bill, uh, prior legislation or a law that's currently in place that needs to be addressed, I think we need to start cleaning up from, from back then. And, and uh, it just makes us uncomfortable moving forward if, if there's things that need to be cleaned up, you know, prior to this bill being introduced. But... Um, it, it doesn't mean that it's uh, dead in the water. Are, are you asking something? Do you, did you want to make a comment or? Okay, well, you know, you, I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> so I, I appreciate, uh, again, um, what you've done to move forward. And again, I request that uh, a round table, I guess it's a morning of round tables, you know, even on my bill that was introduced earlier, I'm requesting for a round table before that bill moves forward. So um, I think we just need to be a little bit more informed and, uh, and the public as well, if we can have that round table for the public to view. So other than that, I, I greatly appreciate all your hard work. I mean, if there is one board that has been diligently working to try and move something forward, it, it, it's been your board. But it's about being um, more transparent, you know, both to us and the public. And I thank you so much. Thank you, Senators. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Leon Guerrero. Uh, I'm, quite, I'm quite impressed with the fact that we've been at this since 2005, that, that this idea of a, a Gatna redevelopment was born in 2005 under one administration, the Comancho administration. It was brought to fruition in terms of a, a plan, an actual tangible plan that was presented to the community um, by the Calvo administration in 2014, and then now resurrected again in 2019 under the Leon Guerrero administration. Um, I, I appreciate that you indicated that there's, uh, in fact, a matrix that addresses what, what, what essentially is a red line version of the first master plan versus this introduction, this iteration um, that is presented to us in this bill format. Um, Christine, you were holding up a, a document which may or may not have been submitted to the committee, and I'm not certain that it was because as, as the vice chair, I, I didn't receive it. The chair might have received it. But, uh, but it, it, do you have, uh, did you have any, any comments or questions just to clarify the, the iteration of this bill versus the last or progress is made, just to give us some assurances about the, um, the version that was submitted? To the committee on rules. You know, um, when you're asking us to be transparent, I think it's would. Okay. I'm sorry, Christine Walk. Um, I'm with Rem Architects. I'm a commissioner on the board uh, for HRRA. Um, when you're asking us to be transparent, I was just pointing out to Maria here that I have email copies that you have all received these documents. I'm sorry if you don't have them in front of you, but we've done our part, and it's, maybe there's something happening in your offices where you're not getting these but it would be really nice if everybody came to the meeting prepared. Thank you. Okay, thank you for, for that clarification. Um, I wanna invite you, Ms. Yangro, if you have any closing statements, uh, you'll be the last to speak on this matter today at this public hearing, but if you had any, anything to add, uh, you're welcome to add any closing statements now. Um, just, I guess, just to reiterate the fact that this has been a long-standing effort. Many people have worked on it. I believe it was transparent. I believed it involved everyone that needed to be involved. Um, I understand the concerns, but again, I don't, I don't think that should preclude us from passing this master plan and getting started on this and seeing some of the fruits of all the labor that has been put in over decades at this point. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your time. Yeah, just a little bit, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the, uh, the concern and the, the request from Ms. Leon Guerrero, but, uh, you know, as a member of the, the, this body that's hearing this, uh, 
I think that they're given the opportunity to be able to first see what was submitted and then be able to ask the questions there. Uh, that was the whole purpose of this public hearing before we can even bring it to, uh, be before the body on the floor. So I would like that, uh, you know, um, for it to be officially uh, noted uh, in this public hearing committee that uh, the, the senators attending the hearing, um, we didn't have that information, and that information is necessary for us to be able, I think is necessary for us to be able to move forward. Thank you. Yes, I just want to note for the record that the information uh, has been submitted and was provided as noted by the, uh, the commission. Um, so, so that is a fact. It, 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 was, it was submitted into the record. Um, it, access to it is, is a, a different issue. But I, I just want to, I just want to uh, say that I commend you for you and your committee and H, H, the Hagatner Restoration and Redevelopment Authority for all the work that you've done. Um, I know going back as, as a, a daughter of Guam, a lot of my memory and the legacies that are passed down from my parents have been stories about Hagatnya, where they lived, where they went to school, how they lived, the commerce that was involved here, um, everything from the pre-war to the, to the World War II experience to the post-World War II experience. And a lot of the fabric of that generation is born in their livelihoods in Hagatnya, notwithstanding you know, their ranches on the outskirts of Aganya. But, but Hagatnya was the identity and th the true bosom of Guam for at least my parents' generation and, and their parents' generations. So I commend you for the vision and for the perseverance. It's been 17 long years, and uh, oftentimes these things are not done overnight. They require a lot of effort, a lot of two steps back, three steps forward, but uh, Ms. Leon Guerrero, thank you, and, and Lacia Casil, thank you for, for presenting today. Um, it is very hard to grasp the idea of, of a, a redevelopment plan for a capital, um, but I think if we, can, if we can appreciate the genesis of why this plan was born, um, I think that, that whole genesis can help bring us to the finish line and to a consensus amongst the community and lawmakers about how we are gonna arrive at that, uh, that place, which I think is a vital place because I certainly hope that what, what was Guam in the eyes of, of the people that raised me can become the Guam of, of the generations after me. Um, and perhaps I'll live long enough to see a lot of the fruition of, of this good effort. So I just wanted to, to leave it on that positive note um, a journey is never always an easy journey, and it's never always straightforward, but, but it, it is a journey nonetheless that we have to take as a people. If it's truly something that we want to do to not only rebuild a, a critical infrastructure, but regain what is historically significant to so many in our community. And uh, I speak from the heart in this point. I'm not necessarily advocating one, one way or another, but I do believe that the, the, the vision is um, a sound vision. The, the redevelopment and um, restoration is a sound uh, principle, just from what I know as a, a daughter of Guam, as a Chamorro woman. And so I, I thank you today. And with that being said, um, I hereby state that Bill number 347-36 is duly heard. And um, we will now proceed with the, the fourth item for today's agenda. Uh, shortly, and, and so I'd like to dismiss you, Ms. Leon Guerrero, and thank you for uh, being here today, and all of those that came in support of this bill. And Ms. Casil Sizus Masi for joining us via Zoom. Our next item is going to be, be bill number 354-36 COR. And I'll just take a moment's recess to gather the documents. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. And uh, excuse me, I'll, I'll, I'll recognize you in a second. 
this. Thank you. So the next item on our agenda is bill number 354-36-COR introduced by Vice Speaker Tina Rose Munya Barnes. It is an act to add a new section 80129 to chapter 80, title five, Guam code annotated, relative to the acquisition of library books, e-books, audio books, digital publications, newsletters, software, and any other publications deemed necessary by the Guam Public Library System. The sponsor of the bill, Vice Speaker Tina Rose Munya Barnes, was unable to join us today. But on behalf of the sponsor, I will read a brief statement on bill number 354-36 on her behalf. In working with the director of library, Mr. Chris Serengan, bill number 354-36 was drafted simply to give the library greater flexibility to determine the tools and services needed to enhance our public library. Libraries play an important role in our community, providing safe access to information in addition to peer-reviewed papers and journals. It's important that our libraries stay up to date with the latest books, journals, and research databases. We author this bill to allow our libraries to continuously improve and adapt to changes in technology. And uh, I will now open the floor to individuals who have signed up. We have quite a listing of uh, individuals who have signed up to testify today. And uh, actually just a, a few who have t uh, signed up for oral testimony. So I'll begin with you, Mr. Chris. Please uh, introduce yourself and begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. M Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Chris Rangan. I am the director for Guam Public Library System. This morning, I, we have quite a few folks are here to give uh, their oral testimony. And uh, some of them uh, have to go back to work. May I uh, close uh, my uh, remarks at the closing remarks, during the closing remarks. At this time, uh, we have here uh, Mr. Francis uh, Bellaris, the librarian of uh, John F. Kennedy High School. He would like, I would like him to give this uh, oral testimony, if I may. Okay, Mr. Francis, you may proceed. Please introduce yourself. Half a day, Manana Sijus, Madam Chair, Senators. My name is Francis Bellaris. I'm here to support Mr. Chris Sarangan with his bill. I've known Mr. Sarangan for many years. Uh, he was a co-teacher of mine back in 2005 at Southern High, and then he joined JFK's team back in 2007. And he's been our librarian there till he vacated and became the Guam Public Library Administrator. Uh, he was also my professor over at the University of Guam as I was going through my library science studies. And uh, I've known him to be very passionate when it comes to the library. So when he took over back in 2007, he was able to transform John F. Kennedy's library from its, during that time, a sad situation to a, a 21st century library. Today it is, as it is. So if you come visit us at our school, you'll see that many of the things he's done are wonderful, uh, innovative, and you know he's brought the library up to, I want to say, almost national standards, uh, considering the constraints he had. And so now that he's at Guam Public Library, I know that he has a passion for the library. I know he has the passion for the people. He wants to bring a lot of innovative programs to the library. I've seen it. Uh, many things that he's done so far in the short time he's been in the Guam Public Library system. So I know he's 100% he's, he's, uh, for the library and the people. And so with this bill, I, I like to support him to help him you know, alleviate some of the things that uh, would hold him back, especially when he comes to having grants and using up that money on time. Uh, I think that this would definitely help him uh, in the process of upgrading the libraries here on Guam reopening them and then presenting them as, as 21st century libraries for our people. And uh, some of the programs you showed me were wonderful. I can't wait to see them implemented. And so I'd like to see uh, or ask for the legislative help to ensure that his program is going forward. And with that said, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Mears, may I ask you to present your testimony now? Signed up for oral testimony, Melissa? Yeah. Yes, hi, please introduce yourself. Uh, okay. 
Okay, half a day, Madam Chair and, and Senators. Um, my name is Marissa Quintanilla Mears, and I'm a GPLS board member. Uh, I am in full support for passage of Bill Number 354-36 relative to the acquisition of library books, digital publications, audiobooks, ebooks, software, and multimedia content. This passage, the passage of this bill will give greater flexibility to GPLS to determine and submit its list of books and related materials to the board for approval and directly to GSA's centralized procurement program. This bill will enable GPLS to reduce the lengthy procurement process and to finally expedite the ability of Director Serengan and the staff to expand their collection of books, publications, and technological resources to its users and the community. Sidus Maasi. Sidus Maasi. May I ask Ms. Geyer to begin? Let's see. Is it on? Yes. Honorable Senators, and I hope that this can also be heard by the 12 Senators that are not present today. Um, I've been a patron of the Nevis Library for 48 years, and I have um, enjoyed the use of our public library many, many times. I've also put on puppet shows there and had displays of uh, ancient relics and he told stories to children at their hours. And I've spent so much time researching in that library and writing, and I can see a positive improvement since uh, Director Chris Serengan has uh, become director there. I have uh, noticed that we do need some more books of the new kind of books that we don't have at our library and that if it can be expedited to bring these in by giving the power to the people who work at the library and to the director and the people on the board there, it would make it easier for the other entities in our government to pass this responsibility on to them and would expedite the new books and videos and all the technologies that might become available through the funding by the federal government or whatever uh, kind of sources, including taking advantage of things that might be given to us that we're not getting unless they can make the decisions because it's just so much paperwork going through all the other entities. So I strongly support uh, bill number 354-36 and I ask you to please pass, pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gary. And yes, this is um, not only live streamed, but it, it's also on YouTube so all, everyone can have the opportunity to watch it uh, at a later time, if not right now. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Rudolph? Oh, half a day. <laughs> yes, um, my name is Jan Rudolph, and um, I recently participated in the Story Hour program implemented by Director Chris Sregan, and, um, you know, that was a, a very uh, nice way to... Uh, engage with the public and there where parents brought in their kids and listened to the story but i am also here to support the passing of bill this bill i would like to see that the guam public uh, the guam library system is authorized to determine what materials and technology it needs for our public library it needs to be able to access funds in a timely and efficient manner and not have to go through the lengthy procurement process. Our director and library board can handle this responsibility. And we are in a new age where we have to acquire books and software when available. The library cannot wait for the time it would take to get all the approvals. Our youth need a strong public library 
with updated and current resources at their disposal, passing this law would be a big step in the right direction. And so I hope that this bill gets passed and uh, we can, you know, get more things that, for that library that we need as that is a central part of our community and would be a great asset for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Rudolph. Uh, Ms. Story? Afade, good morning. My name is Monique Caravo Story, and I come before you as a career librarian, a member of the Guam Public Li Library Board, and a lifetime patron of the Guam Public Library System. I support Bill 354-36 uh, because it gives the Guam Public Library System more control over their responsibility to create and maintain a collection that fits the need of our community. Theoretically, the bill um, helps to fill in some of the gaps in governmental operations when it comes to the libraries. Libraries should be a curated collection of accurate information resources that are reflective of the community's needs and interests. And the responsibility of the selection of resources should reside within the library personnel. Bill 354-36 uh, provides the library with more authority over library acquisitions so that the most appropriate material in its most appropriate formats may be selected for the library. Material selection outside of the library's purview runs the risk of acquiring an unusable resource, meaning lost dollars. Libraries should also maintain timely collections, meaning that the resources held in the library hold the most current information about the subjects they address. By identifying the public library and its board as the authorized selectors, I'm hopeful that Bill 354-36 uh, streamlines the procurement process um, that the library must abide by. Practically, the bill makes sense. As a career librarian, I am all too aware of how Government of Guam procurement uh, legislation and um, processes create challenges for acquiring library resources. Over the decades, I have heard uh, the frustration that school and public librarians have had over placing requests and not knowing when or if or which of their requests were made for, uh, made or were approved. As a board member of the, uh, the Guam Public Library System, I've seen the frustration on the part of all of the library personnel in trying to get through the multiple hurdles of demonstrating need um, to purchase the books and databases and other uh, resources like even their um, library resource management system and feeling a sense of no control over their situation. While tangential to this bill, I will point out that the current government of Guam procurement legislation and processes erode the delegated authority of the librarians and create unnecessary hurdles for all types of libraries, whether it be the public library, school, or the academic libraries. This bill may only address the, public, uh, the Guam public library system, but it also provides an entryway for other types of libraries to address their unique problems. Not having control over what is approved makes it difficult for the public library to carry out the two theoretical points that I brought up earlier. By not having this approval authority, the Guam Public Library faces a cascading challenge of how it builds its collection so that it maintains timely and um, formats that are available and useful to the public. It's cascading because each external decision that is made requires the library to reassess its plan of acquisitions so that the library's collection is balanced. In sum, I'm in support of this measure because the selection of library resources is a duty and a responsibility that should remain in the hands of the library personnel rather than under the control of an external system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Story. The last person who signed up to testify orally today is Ms. Uggen. Thank you. 
When is enough a day, Senator Blas, uh, Madam Chair Torres, and Senator Taitabee? Hafadeh, my name is Linda M. Ogun, Library Technician from the Guam Public Library System. I have been working for the Guam Public Library System for over 36 years already. My directive major task now is coming from GPLS director is to catalog, classify, and process new book collections with three other library technicians assisting, and one out of the three is being directed to process the audiobook collections and ebooks, which is still pending and no results yet. Under his supervision for one year at John F. Kennedy High School Library, I worked with the director of GPLS. It was a short time, but I learned a lot other than just checking in and out books and printing copies for students' requests. I am so thankful that GPLS have a director who is Mr. Chris Serengan. I am confident that Mr. Serengan will provide library services to the community of Guam, but his hands are tight due to our procurement system. Lately, we haven't been receiving any large number of new books, except the books from the Library of Congress that the director secured while he was in Washington, D.C during the ALA conference this year. And before he came to the library, we purchased books from local retail stores in the amount of $5,000, and we basically manage our collection by books being donated by our library patrons. When I'm assigned at the circulation desk or branch libraries, most of our library patrons would ask me, when are we going to get new books? I believe that for whatever reasons, the current procurement system is not helping us in ordering our resources, materials in a timely manner. So therefore, I am asking you all, our senators, plus the 12 that are not here, to please support changing the system so that the Guam Public Library system will function as expected. I hope that in your hearts and minds, please consider in supporting Bill 354-36-COR. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for your support. I find it interesting, um, Mr. Chris, that you have had such challenges in procuring um, material timely material, relevant material, as needed, and not the need not determined by somebody else. Um, in your estimate, though, do you see that this would, would pose any issues with procurement? Or uh, how, how, the question is, how is it in other library systems where they're able to do a sole source, more or less, where they're able to determine that they need X number of, of books in this genre for this age category, uh, et cetera. How is that addressed in other library systems as you're aware? I'm going to say uh, itemize some of the things that's happening in the library. I know that I'm not going away from that question that you had. The challenge is that, uh, that getting um, processed books in an, on a timely manner. Um, at the moment, we are thankful that, uh, that our governor was able to give us uh, quite a bit of money. Uh, close to, if I, can, if I may, we have this uh, ESF-1, we got 201,000, and uh, the ESF-2, almost $2.3 million. And the TAP grant, which is a for just for e-platform, uh, e $130,536. And then an archive, uh, archive digitization uh, project, it's about $499,991.50. And then ARP fund, uh, $448,180. And the uh, 
in the our uh, the five year grant close to about 118 to 120000 which we get every year from imls and the last one uh, first time we were very fortunate to receive a uh, yeah, will uh, um, that was written by one of our patrons uh, who passed away recently that's about $200000 this is a clear indication that the donation, this community wants to support our library. They cannot, uh, you know, the way that is being managed in the past, first of all, you know, we didn't have a director for quite a long time. And uh, because of that, we were not, uh, you know, we couldn't keep up with the demand for these uh, years. These are the years that a lot of technological development took place. Uh, e-books, uh, all kind of things, which we were not able to take part. One reason is the funding. The second one is uh, you know, the, uh, um, the uh, professional uh, contribution to the library. So other libraries now, when you asked me how the other libraries are functioning. I was with uh, DOE libraries for about uh, close to 15 years. I was a, a librarian for John F. Kennedy High School. While I was there, I also was, uh, was uh, involved uh, promoting and uh, building the other school libraries. We have about 41 libraries. Now, I would say the 41 libraries is way ahead of our public, uh, Guam public library system. We have uh, five branches and uh, we have a main libraries. It's like, uh, I can say, it's like you build a nice store, beautiful uh, store, grocery store. It is conveniently located. The people the, who work there are very well trained. But when they go to the store and they will see all the items are outdated and the people see that uh, most of them are damaged. And uh, that will be the best, uh, you know, we are promoting, we are doing everything to get people over there. but. That would be the last trip, one trip, they never come back. That is a classical example, the situation of our libraries here. We, all the libraries are located very conveniently uh, in, the, in the villages. And our Agania library, Agania library um, name is uh, uh, Flores Memory Library. It's, it's awesomely located, you know, you see the heart of Agatnya and uh, you can see, you cannot miss it. But our people work very hard to maintain their place. However, the building the collection, keeping up to date is the challenge right now. So my concern is that unless we change the system, we have al more than uh, almost $3 million uh, in grants, and uh, if we do not do things to speed up the process, we may, I am afraid that we might lose all this grant money. So we might end up uh, returning the money. So this is very crucial that we uh, pass this uh, bill so that we will be able to get this, uh, make it, take advantage of this grant money. In the history of uh, the library, we never got this kind of money. I'm thankful that our governor was uh, able to give us this kind of uh, grant money and uh, we want to make uh, use of every penny of it. Thank you. So what, and I, th I think you speak spe uh, very specifically to the bill's intention, which is to give the, the library um, the authority to determine what books and e-books and audio books and digital productions and newsletters, software, other ob application, okay. publications are yes. needed. And, and that, that basically is the cut to the chase that, yeah. uh, in, in fact, Ms. Story talked about and many of you talked about as well, correct? It's, so it's, it's just for you to determine what it is and to fast track it through the GSA process, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, what is going to happen is that uh, we will be the one to decide what we want and then we take up that, uh, whatever we decide to give it to the board, the board will be the ultimate uh, decision maker in this process. So once it's done, then we will submit to the, submit to GSA, and they will be the one to issue and check and balance, you know, all the making payment and things like that. So 
uh, you know, if I may say this, uh, like 130,000, it's going to be just for e-books alone. You know, uh, our uh, counterparts in the mainland, they are already making use of that. Our folks go to the mainland and see the libraries and come back, hey, what happened to the e-books? You know, we, we were, when we were there, we were able to download books, we were able to use it uh, uh, using our device, but we don't have anything. That's, that's what some of our library technicians shared a uh, few minutes ago. And the next one is the one is the 499,000. That is a very, very um, urgently needed uh, um, uh, process. And we are in a process of digitizing all of our uh, heritage uh, materials, in me meaning the Guam-related materials. We all have it in hard copies. And we want to digitize those things. And so that we, and also now, we, when we digitize, we have to do the copyright law and all of these things. So that is very crucial that we need to get that going. We already done all our work uh, in terms of uh, the resources and the equipment uh, and the consultant and so forth. So everything is set. But if you, if you depend on GSA, you know GSA itself, they feel that it is time for you guys to be independent and get this done. They themselves supporting this bill. If you look at some of their uh, um, t testimonies, they are 100% they are supporting uh, this bill so that we will be able to get this uh, done. Yes, thank you very much. Senator Taigui, any questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the panel who's here to testify. It's always good to see other librarians from the public school system here to to be here, so I appreciate your time. I, I won't be labor this because I know some of you have to leave early, but um, you know, what was the Guam, uh, Mr. Director, what was the Guam Public Library doing to acquire books prior to this bill? Uh, thank you, Senator, for asking that question. Uh, I, as uh, according to the record, there was one time they have purchased uh, books from a company, private company in the, from the mainland. Other than that, uh, what they usually do, they wait, uh, as uh, Linda Ogan said, they wait until sometime September when they have leftover money and take that money and then they use the, I mean, of course, if they get the purchase order and go to a, one of our retail stores and buy those books from the shelf. And they have done that one. Other than that, there's no, right now, we have uh, allocated more than $250,000 for just only books, hard copy books, uh, other than that $130,000 for e-books. Uh, so for many, many years, we were just, uh, the library is just basically surviving by the donation from the patrons. They donate, when they, whenever they leave the island, they donate those books, and they, catalog it, and they put them on the shelf. They don't, I don't think any, any, any of these, our folks will say, they have not received a large, like, like the way we are doing right now, so $250,000 from our ESF2 fund, uh, fund, and uh, there was no purchase at all. If you, the eight, you know, we have five branch libraries and one main library, 8,000 is not going to take anywhere, you know, and especially when you buy those books from our shelves on a retail store, you are not going to get that much that many books to put them on the shelf. You know, we have to divide it by six. You know, we have six libraries. So historically, uh, they have not done any kind of major purchases, and until this year, this year we have uh, we wrote the grant. You know, to write the grant, it, you have to go through so much tedious works. And we have the money now. And this is going to be the first time in the history, that's as far as I remember. I may be uh, wrong. As far as I remember, this is the first time that we are going to be spending this much money. But I, unless we pass the law, bill, this bill, we won't be able to, I am afraid that we may not be able to spend that money. Um. You received 400,000, 440,000, what was the amount, 400? Okay, if you look at it. And is this the ARP funding? Yeah, the, if you look at it, that ESF2 funding, 
that's about $2.3 million. Uh -huh. That's uh, include for renovating the library, uh, uh, buying shelves, and also in that, uh, in, that amount, in the total amount, we have uh, set aside for $250,000 just for books. Just for books, hard, but hard copy books. okay, your budget uh, in, in the FY23 uh, budget, I believe you received uh, 1.2 million. Uh, well, actually, it's 1,240,449 for your budget, correct? Does that yes. sound right? Yes. Okay, for FY23. And you're saying that you have an additional uh, amount that was given to you, um, ex about 2 million, you said, or? No, if you look at it all together, about three million dollars. You you on on top of your budget. Okay. Top of my our on budget. You received an See, additional three yeah, million, correct? Yes. The budget for annual budget that we cut from our general fund, eighty-five to ninety percent goes to payroll. Okay. And then five percent goes to utilities. So we, we hardly had any money right. to purchase. I'm not, I'm not questioning your budget. I'm just questioning the additional funding that you received. Is this ARP funding, the $2 million that you received? Okay, this is a, has a different name, ES of 1. That is the Education Stabilization Fund. Okay, right, okay. Uh, that's one. Then it's Education Stabilization Fund 2. Okay. That's about $2.3 million. 2.3. Yeah. And the ebook platform, it's okay. in a, still. Uh, what I, I see now, that none of it is ARP funding. It's actually grant money. And grant money, exactly. Right. Okay, so I, I wanted to know. So, yeah. what is the uh, um, time period in which you have to expend this grant funding? Well, some of them, like I'm concerned about that $130,000 uh, for the ebook. That's, I think, maybe a year or two? Oh. Yeah, two more years. Two uh, years? Yes. Is that for the, 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 all the grants? I mean, it looks like you have $3 million worth of... Well, the first one, uh, years of one, we are pretty much we are done with that funding because uh, we hired okay. uh, five library technicians. Okay. Uh, we updated with our computers and a uh, few other things. You, so you, you f feel free to come up if you want, you know, yeah. if you have all the, uh, the yeah. numbers uh, to yes. simplify it for me. And just... Just kind of tell me of, of those three grants that were provided. Um, I mean, what we're doing here is we're trying to bypass, you know, what's put in place currently right now to accommodate this additional funding that's been given to the library. So I just want to see what is the time frame and, and why we would have to, you know, what's the justification really to, uh, you know, change the law right now. So if you, if, and if you state your name for the record, please, and then kind of explain yeah. to me those grants and when they're due, uh, you have to expend them by a certain mm -hmm. time. Okay, my name is June Affleckley. I'm the administrative officer for the library. So the first one that he's um, talking about, the Education Stabilization Fund, that one, that grant has expired already. So you've, uh, you expired it and, and you were able to u utilize mm -hmm. the full amount. Okay, and that was for how much? I'm sorry? 201,000. Can you speak into the mic? I'm sorry. 201,000. Okay. And the next one? Um, okay. So the ESF2, uh, 2.3 million that he, he mentioned earlier. Right. Um, we haven't received funding for that yet. When is it expiring? There's about two more years on that, 2024. Okay. And then the last one? If then I'm not the last one, there's three. the DOI TAP grant expires in 2023. Next year? Next Correct. year, yes. What, what month? September. September, so you have a little less than a year to, to try and expend that. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's good information to know, you know, and trying to push. I understand the, the concerns that you have in trying to utilize this money right away. Uh, the last question I have would be, um, you mentioned a digitizing, uh, quickly putting something together. Is that software that you need to purchase? Or uh, uh, these aren't books, right? This is just software to, to be able to digitize everything is well, if you come to can you speak in the mic sir please yeah. thank you if you come to the second floor of our library you will see a lot of our newspapers magazines related to guam and uh, these are all hard copies so we want to digitize those so that uh, it's, it will be easy to, for people to access uh, they can they should be able to access any of, any of our data while they're at home if they as long as they have internet so this is 
this is this particular grant came from the lieutenant governor's office mm. and uh, as far as securing the resources for this to take this uh, project off the ground we have done already we have uh, found uh, the scanners mm -hmm. and uh, we have found the software mm -hmm. so we just a matter of it's getting the uh, process purchasing done okay so it's already in progress and how much did you receive from the lieutenant governor for this project uh, 499,991 yes. and you're already in process with uh, that not quite processed we have secured the resources but not purchased yet Oh, so you yes. still have to go through the procurement yes, process. Yes, yeah, probably that. So and this I, is yes. delaying you. Yeah, delay. It will delay. And that's why for the bill. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's and, good. Uh, you know, this is very, uh, very important for us. Uh, you know, these uh, the material that right. we have are kind of very old. You know, if we keep it uh, for a long time, it mm -hmm. may not last that long. This funding, the $400,000 from the lieutenant governor, yes, is this ARP funding? Is this ARP funding or is no, it under another it, grant? This is, uh, this is another grant. It's a Department of Interior. Oh, the Interior grant. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Senator Frank, any questions? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm a little confused here. I, I guess the whole intent of the bill was to streamline your procurement process is this what this bill yes this bill is to speed up our uh, pro procurement process by having our own uh, system in our library with our board and then uh, once we decided the what the kind of material we wanted and we get the price quotation and the board board will be the ultimate uh, decision maker in this uh, so we submit to the board, and the board will say, "Okay, this is where this is what we want." And That's so, and then we submit to the uh, G submit to GSA, and they will uh, do all the purchasing and things like that. But they are not going to spend time selecting this or that because most of them are like, for an example, e-books. We have been having uh, almost uh, like in eight or nine months. It was it has been rejected because of the, the vendor comes with a different uh, uh, spec and uh, GSA and all of that. So finally, it's still in, in the, hopefully we're going to get it done. So this, our processing, our purchasing is, is not up to date with our technology, especially with the library. Material. So what you're saying is then you've got a purchase order or you want to be able to purchase ebooks and audiobooks it's the gsa buyer that makes the determination as to uh, what ultimately we make uh, but right now since there is no law but they are they will be the one to make the final uh, purchase but so who makes the determination as to what ebook or audiobook is going yes, to be purchased yes yes uh, yeah they you negotiate they negotiate with the vendor and uh, and they get a price quotation and whoever is right now out there for bidding. So whoever is going to give us a better price and a better service, and they will be the one to decide. We, we won't get involved in their decision making. Okay, so what does your purchase order look like when you send it down to GSA? Well, the GSA is their standard uh, purchase order. They will issue uh, based on their uh, conditions. And uh, see, GSA is used to getting things by s touching it, seeing it, and, uh, and uh, receiving it, materials. But in this case, they only can see, for an example, e-books. You don't, you don't go the, literally go and uh, take it. It's, when we decided, say, $148,000 worth of books, that's going to be posted in our website. Say so we make a payment today, the following day when they receive the payment, all the books that we wanted, it's going to be in our website. So the patrons uh, will, be, uh, will be notified, and they, when they have this uh, device, has an app. When they app, then they can 
choose the kind of books they want to read and say they give two weeks or three weeks. Once the time is done, and that automatically is goes away okay. from them. Okay, let me take for this for example. You've got the Guam Police Department who wants a 2023 Dodge Charger with six cylinders, uh, you know, obviously four doors, you know, and, and all this. Um, and that's what they get. I'm just trying to figure out how this would help you to ensure, that's why I'm asking, who makes the determination as to what ebooks to get? Is it the G, is GSA right now? Well, when we get the bid, when we get the bid, they open right. the bid, they have the list of the books, title, different companies will come and say, okay, $10 a book or $15 a book, right. and they will give it to the amount of uh, $120,000 worth of books. Right. So one vendor is giving, uh, say, 500 titles, another vendor is going to give you 800 titles, and the service, how often they can, what kind of title, and nowadays, uh, there are six lending models. For an example, we can get a book mm -hmm. and post it on our website, and uh, and we pay only the way how how many people read. Say, for an example, ten people uh, borrow that book and read, and we will end up paying dollar a book, dollar a per patron, things like that. That's a different thing. I understand. Yes, I, I'm just one. I'm just wondering whether this language is strong enough so that it does, it's, it's specific enough for that. Yes, they will give that. Because the as I read this language. Oh, I see. On oh. the bill. Mm, I see, I see. Um, it still gives the authority for GSA to be able to decide what books they're going to get. No, in this case, we select the items. The board selects the item, right. board approves it, and the list of the title and give it to GSA, GSA will order I, the Then title. if that be the case, I, don't, I really don't see why there is a need for the bill. I, I, again, I'm not trying to circumcise. No, no I, I, I'm glad I you're asking. I'm so glad you're asking. I understand what you're saying yes. and that the bill reflects that. Because as I read the bill now, okay, based on what I read and what I hear is your intent, there's a gap that's missing here that I'll probably, you know, we have to work with the committee on being able to address that so that it is specific to what you, the, the purpose of what you want. If you want a certain ebook or a class of ebooks, you know, on, you know, National Geographic, let's just take that for example, okay, in a certain format, whether it be, you know, a Art PDF copy, format yeah, or, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Okay, that that is what you're going to be able to get. Okay, right now, as it stands, as this bill stands, it's still it, to the interpretation of GSA, and it may not fit that purpose. So I just want to make sure that. I see. Okay? That's Thank why I, I asked, I asked okay. these radicals. Okay. I appreciate, and I appreciate that, that you're going to go to. I love e-books. I, my iPad is full of e-books, and I'd like to be able to... Like, to get a subscription or to be able to borrow from you guys. Yes. Instead of me having to buy from Amazon. Okay? <laughs> All right? So I uh, appreciate that. So I just wanted to make sure, because what I'm reading in the bill and what I'm hearing, two different things. Okay? So I just want to make sure that that's, we, we tighten that up for you. Okay? Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Senator Blas. I'm so glad that you're going to help us make sure this bill gets through whether amended or otherwise, but uh, thank you for, for being here. And uh, this now concludes uh, our hearing on bill number 354-36, and I call it duly heard. I wanna thank all of you who came to testify today. Thank you, especially to this panel for sticking it out uh, while three bills ahead of you were being heard. I appreciate your, your patience, uh, and I recognize your commitment to the library systems and to ensuring that the materials are well received uh, in the manner and, and uh, in the form that, that is important to the library systems. And I think that message was impressed. We also learned so much about the library system today, and I, I appreciate all of you coming and uh, from the perspective of librarians, board members, patrons, um, to 
to have you know us understand the um, what seems like a simple fix to a problem that really needs to be addressed and corrected um, in Guam law. Bill number, uh, again, thank you to everyone who came to testify on all four bills. Bill number 308-36-COR, bill number 331-36-LS, bill number 347-36-LS, and bill number 354-36-LS all have been duly heard, and I now call this public hearing adjourned. The time now is 12.05. Uh, any individuals who wish to submit testimony will have 10 days from today to do so. Uh, testimony can be submitted via in email to Senator Munya Barnes at guamlegislature.org or you can uh, call or hand, mail or hand deliver to our Congress building address 163 West Chalan Santo Papa, Hagatnya Guam, 96910. Sidus Maasi again everybody and uh, thank you and have a very safe and uh, meaningful leading up to Thanksgiving holiday celebration. Sizu Smasi.